6.35, okay, I'll call the meeting to order. Um, anyone who's uh, just talk, mentioned a little bit about meeting logistics, if you're joining remotely, please change your name on your computer display to your first and last name. Anyone who wishes to speak, please state your name and where you live. Um, we ask that you keep your comments or questions to under two minutes. If you're speaking about a specific agenda item, please keep your comments germane to the topic at hand. Anyone who wishes to speak, can you can hear me? Can anybody hear me? How about now? Is it coming out now? Anything? Okay, great. Sorry about that, folks. Anyone who wishes to speak must be called on by the mayor. Um, once you're called on, you may make a statement or ask a question, but if you have multiple comments or questions, please group them all together so as to avoid having a back and forth uh, between members of the council and uh, members of the public. And if it's working for you, Donna. Okay. And or whatever you may be interrupted. First item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. And we have a couple of, uh, couple of changes. Item number seven, the Public Arts Commission update is not uh, ready to go forward tonight. So that's off the agenda. Also item number eight, the request from Heaton Woods. Um, someone's, uh, vital to the discussion is not able to be here tonight so uh, we'll take that up at another time and i think that's all of them right okay first uh, next item is general business and appearances this is an opportunity for any member of the public who wishes to address the council on any item not on tonight's agenda uh, we have uh, a total of 30 minutes and no more than three minutes per person and uh, I'll scan the people in the in the room to see if anyone wants to be wants to address the council. Looks like not. So we'll take uh, comments from people uh, online, uh, starting with Peter Kelman. I I would just ask that something be done about the website. I I guess it's in transition from some former way that agendas and meeting agendas used to work to something else. But this is, I, I've, I brought this to the attention of um, uh, Evelyn from last week, but it's, it's broken. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. I, I think it is a work in progress and hopefully we'll get uh, on top of that. Um, anybody else online? I am not seeing any hands raised. Okay. We can uh, move next to the consent agenda. And there are some items that are, uh, we've asked that people have asked to remove from the consent agenda. Um, the water system hydraulic analysis, do we want that off? Okay. And, uh, the Country Club Road update and the uh, amendment of the memorandum, memorandum of understanding with the Mountaineers. Anything else that people need would like to remove from the consent agenda? Okay. Yes, please. The consent agenda removing D and J. And is it D and J? I'm saying. Okay. Okay. Those are showing up as different items, different letters in, on mine, but fine. Well, I can I can say them out loud. The water system. F. Country Club Road and Mountaineers. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Is there a second? All those in favor? Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. 
Oppose? Okay. <clears throat> Why don't we just take the others items up in order right now? Uh, the water system hydraulic analysis. And I see Kurt in the room. Um, hello, Hi, I'm Kurt Modica, Director of Public Works. Uh, so yeah, we have two amendments on, um, or what was on the consent agenda for tonight regarding the Are water folks in here in the back. Okay, great. Yep. Okay. Um, so amendment number one is related to a more detailed analysis on the capacity at the fire hydrants within the water system. Um, something that we've always wanted is a quick reference for both DPW and the fire department. Um, Long-term goal would be to color coat the, um, the nozzle covers on the hydrants so that for quick reference, you'd kind of have a range. There's a guidelines for through American Public Works Association for uh, what colors you use for different flow ranges. Um, and I think this is, a, this is the right time to do that. And um, so that's amendment one. We, we put it in um, uh, to the state back in February. There's a long lead time on the review for the state to approve that amendment. Um, this amendment is 100% funded by the state. So it's a loan, but it's loan forgiveness through subsidy. Um, so that's amendment number one. Amendment number two is related to the state of Vermont's comments on the draft report. Um, they had pretty extensive um, requests as far as doing initial uh, additional hydraulic analysis, looking at other alternatives than what the um, consultant provided in the report. Um, so it's a high level of effort, um, more than um, the original scope uh, carried and the original contract. So uh, this amendment, again, is 100% funded through the state, um, so no, no cost direct to the city, um, and also has been reviewed and approved by the state. And uh, we really need to advance it um, tonight in order to um, be, able, be able to hold the public comment uh, meeting on May 10th. Um, we want the, the opportunity to be able to go through um, the consultant's response to the various comments from the state, and they can't start that work until we, um, you know, execute this amendment, um, allowing them to do the the additional services. Any questions from members, <laughs> Lauren? Hey, Kurt. One question: Are you thinking of inviting someone from DEC to join us at that meeting? It would just be really helpful to be able to hear from them directly instead of. Trying to read between the lines. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We already have invited them. Awesome. I do okay. plan. Uh, they do plan to have someone here. Thank you. So, um, thanks, Kurt. I um, I appreciate the explanation. It it did make sense to me when I looked at the amendment number one and saw that the signature was back in January and and it talked about putting a table into the report that was sent in February. So I didn't quite understand what what was up with that. But it sounds like it took a while for that to be. Uh, approved by the state. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions from members? Eric? Um, I'd just like to make a motion that we authorize the city manager or designee to execute amendments number one and two to the preliminary engineering report on the water system hydraulic analysis, as well as the associated drinking water state revolving loan fund amendment. I'll second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Okay, next we have Country Club Road update. Are you on for this? Okay. Sure. Um, so we put this item on the agenda to um, brief council in advance of the next public engagement sessions, uh, which will be starting on Saturday. Um, included in that memo are some of the um, costs of the infrastructure, which I know was of particular interest um, to the council. And so we wanted to get this in front of you. Um, we will be bringing the results um, from the public engagement sessions forward in May um, at the May 24th meeting. Um, so there'll be an opportunity for more discussion. Um, and so teeing it up there, um, are there specific questions? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Um, 
I'm a little curious. The there are three. There's a, there's a uh, a brief update letter with uh, some costs, and then there are three diagrams. Is that the extent of the presentation that's going to be made? Are there? Uh, I mean, I really recall last time there was a fairly elaborate slideshow, and yes, so there will be uh, slides um, to accompany those three concepts, but those three concepts will really be the showcase of that presentation. Okay. Um, it's not uh, clear to me where some of the um, some of the co cost numbers come from and where they start and stop. So, for example, I noticed that the recreation and community area is not included, but I under I wonder where where does the infrastructure that the numbers apply to start and stop? In other words, is is anything accounted for from say Route Two up the hill through the rec? community area to the housing area, just as a, an example. Okay. Um, so I can certainly make sure that we do um, touch base with the consultants to be sure to um, describe that as part of the public engagement. Um, my understanding is that the infrastructure costs do cover basically everything with the exception of that area that that is the recreation area. Um, but that being said, you know, it, it may warrant um, a little bit more information and clarification. Well, yeah, I think they're sort of scary numbers to a lot of people, and they're going to need to know um, yeah. in some detail. I, I'm sure that some people are, at the meetings are going to want sure, yeah. quite a bit so, of details surrounding it. Yeah, so we met this morning, um, the internal team, to review that table and those numbers um, to go into detail at the presentations. Um, and so... Um, your question about the infrastructure in particular and sort of the meets and bounds of that, um, I think we can flesh out a little bit. I, um, in terms of the numbers and where those calculations are derived from, for instance, like the TIF portion of that table, um, it, we have already flagged it to be discussed further. That's good. <laughs> good to hear. Um, and uh, Bill Fraser has his hand up. I'd like to. Still muted. There. Um, yeah, I don't need any special, uh, um, attention here. I just wanted to weigh in that um, we put this forward when, when we were preparing to do the public outreach portion that's coming up. Kelly briefed me on what the team was. And I, I think I may be somewhat, there may have been some confusion on our end, just to be clear. I just, the message I sent was we need to make sure the council has seen these numbers, has seen these layout before we go showing them to the public. That, you know, we weren't really planning to have every piece of, you know, the presentation put together, but we also didn't want to have any surprises or any of you showing up to some of the, um, some of the public sessions, not having seen the magnitude or those kind of things. So um, I, I, I'm not sure we could have, we didn't necessarily need to even put it on the consent agenda, it could have just been in the weekly memo as here's what's going on. We just want to make sure you had had a chance to see it was really informational before uh, so that you had the, the, the advanced peak. And of course, when you get the advanced peak, the public can see the advanced peak, but uh, that there were no surprises for any of you if you showed up. So so we appreciate the questions now, and I think that will help the presentations even more. Uh, and that was one of the reasons we wanted you to have them was whether you brought them up at this meeting or privately to any of us so that we can do a better job, but mostly so you didn't get caught uh, hearing stuff the first time at a public session. Thanks, Bill, and way way to enjoy your vacation. Uh, good to see you here. <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't miss it for anything, <laughs> Carrie. Oh, um, so I don't know if this is a question that you can answer, Kelly, but I just wanted to kind of put it out there as we're thinking about the future and next steps. And um, it's uh, we have these different possible concept ideas in front of us, and I'm wondering if the consultants, if part of their scope of work is to be looking at how any of these might actually be implemented, whether it involves, you know, selling lots or partnering with a developer or doing it ourselves or, or all of that. Um, yes. So I think that the, the master plan that will come forward in June will have some pretty clear recommendations on next steps. Um, there definitely will be some conversations around which way you want to go. Um, because there are some really big policy items there. Um, so yeah, for sure. Uh, excuse me if I use my post-it notes, but this one for me, um, there's just, we are nowhere near ready to make decisions. You, you get on top. Of this Sorry. Thing. And we're not uh, muted on this too. Sorry. Oh, you should be. Yeah. The, uh, 
No, you stay muted. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Okay. So we haven't done any engineering or upfront work on this site from what I've been told. I, I think the numbers that we got from White and Burke in this recent memo are high level estimates. Um, one might use the term spitballing, but it gives you the sense that they're giving you a ballpark of some things they're anticipating would be issues to have on the radar screen. Um, the, the, the upfront due diligence that probably should have happened in the very beginning still hasn't happened. And that's what's going to drive this process. Good development is not driven by public hearings. Good development is driven by data and, and the facts of the site and, and the details of what it'll handle, access roads and water sewer lines and utilities. None of that's been done. Um, so this schedule that indicates that it's going to have these three public sessions to look at these plans that are without this data, just a waste of time and ridiculous, in my opinion. Um, and they're just uninformed. Um, you know, I look at the option three, there aren't even enough units on that to even attempt to pay for the road if you're going to try to get there. Uh, you don't need an MBA in, in real estate development to look at that and come up with it. So really, at best, you've got two options. Of the options shown, um, Initially, I think that the last piece that Stephanie showed is there were five pods of development, five different sections that looked like they could partially be parceled out. Now we're just down to three. Uh, I, I'm just really concerned with the numbers we're seeing that I think are exceedingly low, even though they're big numbers, um, and that we've cut the scale of it back before we even get out of the box. I, I, this is not going to work. I, I think we need a total stop on this for a minute. We need to invest in the engineering. I think the public hearings, I'm not sure what we're pulling people through. You know, they're going to give us their ideas, share their thoughts, which is nice, but it's, it's not based on data or information. It's just based on what they think, it, 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 what they feel, but it's not market data. It's not types of housing the market needs. Um, you can just sense my frustration. I think we're really goofing this up. And um, I'd rather stop it now and get it right then keep spending money on it. We hired a prestigious and rather expensive consultant to help us with this process. Um, and that's still rolling, but the results that you're going to generate from the process, I just don't think it's a good investment without the engineering data to drive it. Uh, okay, thanks. Yeah, and I guess the last piece I would suggest, which I think people I talked to in the community feel it's a good, they're excited about the potential for the project, but everyone I talk to also uses the word affordable. They're concerned that we can afford to do this and how it's going to affect their taxes and will it affect our ability to pay for our water and sewer and infrastructure issues that we also have before us. So it's really big picture is how do we get this to be a viable project? And if it's not, we should have an exit strategy for it. Thanks, Tim. Bailyn. Um, I just want to mention that maybe it is in the chart. Maybe I couldn't read it uh, right. Is it the total cost? Because we talk about that this project might take longer than five years. So are we talking about this, you know, cost for five year cost, one year cost, two year cost? And if we have something estimated like city or, you know, this project can be done in six years and this will be the cost, and this cost will affect each individual resident in Montpelier that much money yearly. It will be, I think, very good start for people to decide if they want, want this or not. Because if we don't know as a residents how much we have to contribute through taxes or other things, I think it will be difficult to decide to say yes or no. Thank you. Thanks. We're getting all those questions down. So, are we set? No action is required on this item. So, but is it possible to take action, Jack? I mean, if, if we want to slow it down, maybe put the public hearings on hold. Is, is that a motion I would need to make? It, it is a motion you could make. You know, I, I I'm concerned about taking an action like that without having it on the agenda. And uh, okay. And giving people an opportunity to to prepare for it, giving uh, city staff an opportunity to to be able to respond. Yeah. So, so I, that I understand. 
But, but I hear, I totally hear what you're saying. I've brought it up three times now, and I'm trying to find a way to learn the ropes here to figure out how to mm-hmm. take action and don't just sit and listen all the time. I'm really concerned that the track we're on is not the right track. I don't know how the rest of the council feels, but um, it would be nice to get a sense of that. And Bill Fraser. Uh, you know, I can appreciate the, the um, comments that Council Member Heaney has made and you know, certainly has raised them before. Uh, and, you know, here's here's where we run into these these areas when we transition from one sort of iteration of the council to the next. The, the prior group was very clear and very uh, specific about wanting a, a public process, public engagement process. And this plan was laid out and approved by that council. So uh, we've been following that. And I, I do think that a change from that would be would probably re- require a vote of the council to do so. Um, but I'd also just make another suggestion. I know I've mentioned it privately uh, to Tim and maybe to the mayor, um, but one thing we could do, and, and uh, obviously it would be up to the council to decide A, to do it and who does it, but one v- idea might be to have a council rep to the project team. And uh, right now it's just our staff and um, and and the, the consultants and, you know, I, I, uh, he could certainly refuse, but I think, you know, Council Member Heaney would be a great person because then he could really vet some of those questions uh, and, and work it that way and help. So maybe we could continue the process and also be, uh, be dealing in the right direction. If the council doesn't want to do that, Tim doesn't want to do it, fine. But uh, just one thought. I think that's a great idea. And Tim, is that something you're, you Can have I the capacity you, to do? Does he need to be appointed? So everyone agree that Tim should fill this role for us. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for volunteering. I think your <laughs> input will be valuable. Excuse me, Jack. Can I make one more comment? Yeah. Um, I I understand where where Tim is coming from. Um, I also recall that during the discussions when White and Burke were making their presentation to. Um, be selected to consult this design of uh, public input early public input was a way of um foreshortening some of the planning time as i recall they they were they were thinking they were, would be able to cut it from you know 18 months or two years down to maybe half half of that um and i i guess i'm at this point we're so far along in that process i'm willing to take one more step, but I, I can't imagine how a master plan could be produced, which is what they're, they're saying they will present to us sometime in June without doing the kind of thing that Tim's talking about. So uh, it might be that it would be worth uh, scheduling that for a future meeting. Thanks. Lauren, did you have your hand up? Um, yeah, I'd really appreciate the discussion and issues being raised and especially Tim's willingness to work with a, with a team. Um, I mean, one thought is as we're doing this public process, if there's a way to make sure that the team is really building in clear, like here's the information that the next phase is going to gather. Here are decision points. Like I, I do agree that I don't want it to seem like, Oh, you've got a, B and C and that's your decision. And that's the end of the story or something, but more, here's the key considerations. We need to make sure that the cost per unit is going to make sense for the project to go forward. And there's going to be more information and there's going to be more decision points once we get this additional information. So somehow just being really clear that, you know, we're presenting some ideas um, and a bunch of key information is like, here are the things that we're going to be finding out in the next phase that will then influence the decisions um, from there. So it, that might already be part of what they're thinking, but just I, I think framing it in the right way of what we're really asking of people and where this fits in the bigger process could be helpful. Uh, Peter Kelman. Uh, Peter Kelman, uh, Montpelier. Um, I, I think Sal uh, and, and Lauren have actually raised a, a point, Tim, that I think uh, it's not, I think everybody would agree that the engineering and the due diligence needs to happen. The purpose, as Bill uh, Frazier said, of having a public engagement process was 
to make the whole process be more transparent, to invite the public in, to hear what they what they feel about various things. It was not to, and I think this is a South point, to get to a master plan uh, through that process. And I think South's idea sounds good that maybe we needed a little bit of a delay. I mean, maybe it's time for the public uh, engagement process to wrap up this spring and then go next into the uh, uh, the, the the engineering uh, due diligence that will that you'll be a great member of the of the committee beyond. I, I don't think you need to get that by knocking the public engagement process. The public engagement process is psychologically important to this town. It it it, it it's it's a matter of trust that this is not all being des decided behind closed doors. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Are we set to move forward? Okay. Next up, we have the uh, item of the Mountaineers uh, Memorandum of Understanding. Are you up for this? I, uh, I think well, I, let's, I'm, I'm sorry. Let's get a presentation okay, from great. Kelly and then. Got it. Um, so we put this on the agenda um, for you to take a look at. Um, we met um, with uh, leadership from the Mountaineers to discuss a couple of the terms, um, just to sort of get this in place and um, ensure that it was ongoing rather than year over year. Um, and then also to uh, address some of the um, operational pieces, um, such as the restrooms and the pump house um, costs. And so we're bringing this to you so you can take a look at it. You get a red line version that shows those adjustments. Um, but as I understand it, there are questions. Oh, yes, I had I had just had a question uh, wondering if we could uh, introduce the the notion of uh, low noise fireworks at any displays that the Mountaineers decide to put on uh, per some discussions we've had here from residents. So um, I do have the fire chief here um, to, to speak that a little bit. Um, based on the way that this MOU is structured, they would go forward for a permit, and that would be in our ordinance. What you've suggested yeah. would likely be a change to our ordinances. And Bob could speak a little bit more into the detail in the okay. process. Right, yeah. I, I, I really think it needs to, it, to go that route needs to be an ordinance change. We currently have signed two permits with the Mountaineers for two separate shows. Additionally, we've signed permits with National Life for the Do Good Fest. And I'm expecting a permit any day from Montpelier Live for the July 3rd event. So I think to put something on the Mountaineers MOU, mm -hmm. um, that would that would be putting restrictions on them that we've not put on either the National Life Do Good Fest or you know their permits or uh, permit uh, sent me uh, signed by myself and the police chief based on the city ordinance. And right now, the city ordinance does not require any noise limitations. Okay, well, that's that's that seems like the the key element, really. If if the permitting, because I was wondering what the how the permitting process would would affect. I, I know it's it's late uh, in the season for even for this year, but um, it sounds like the the permitting really is based strictly on the on the ordinance, the language in the ordinance. So. Um, any any change would apply to anyone who would. would right, I think if, if you want to make that change, it would have to be an ordinance change. Because mm -hmm. we, yes, you're, you're absolutely correct. We issue the permit based on the ordinance. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, interesting, my, my question is, um, so this basically extends the agreement um, through 2036. Is that correct? So yes, it is my understanding that that was the the term um, agreed to prior um, when we looked at this in 2015. But I would look to Arnie a little bit to see if that's correct. And I think the intent here is really just to, rather than having to come back for the review year over year, we would be just extending it for the full term. I, Arnie from the Recreation Department. That that is correct. The reason they wanted to go through 2036 initially was for the possibility of them being able to gain grants and stuff. 
because if it's a real short-term lease, a lot of times it's very difficult to acquire grants. The other thing, if you look at that, there's a review every five years, so we can make adjustments to the MOU if they need to be made, if things start to cost more and different things like that happen. We have that in there to review and adjust as needed. What would the grants that they're uh, applying for be like, like for improvements to the, to the facilities? To the facility, yeah, they're trying to, I mean, one of the things we're hoping for in the near future is trying to find an opportunity for a bathroom grant to try to renovate bathrooms down there. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that they're very interested in and, and we're look, trying to find opportunities for that. And presumably any improvements like that would be available, not just during Mountaineers games, but whenever it's being used by the public. That's correct. Yeah. Any improvements actually that the Mountaineers do to the field is that becomes the property of the city. So. <laughs> So interestingly, I, I was on the school board because back then the school board controlled the rec fields and, um, when this started. So it's, Mountaineers have been wonderful for Montpelier, and it's great to see. My, my concern with it is I think it's great that people just talk about it and understand. I'm not trying to rock the boat, but I, it's the field isn't used by kids other than camps the Mountaineers does, right? It's pretty much for the Mountaineers. No, it's actually, it's yeah. actually used by... Um... Uh, the Babe Ruth program. Okay. Um, they do a summer ball league. They also do a fall ball league and also the high school and middle school uses the field. Um, <clears throat> the other groups that use it is a, a men's baseball group. Um, the Montpelier Montes, I believe they're called and they're <laughs> the over 35 league, I think. <laughs> so they have, um, they, they use it on a lot of Sundays throughout okay. the season. Great. So there's actually quite a bit of use besides Mountaineers that use that field. I mean, just following the Elks conversation, it seems like if we're looking at potentially spending millions upon that hill to create more recreation fields and facilities, um, we've also got to keep this in our mix of, of resources that we have available. So that's my only trepidation about tying it up to 2030 or 2036 yeah, um, versus if it was like a five-year agreement or something, at least it would give us some flexibility if, if we do need more playing fields and we find the numbers if elsewhere look, are really high. If you look through high. the um, memorandum of understanding, yes. there also is a termination mm -hmm. of clause. So if something some, somewhere down the road comes up that we need this space for something else, then we can terminate the we agreement. Can. Okay. So we just have to give enough lead time so it's not Obviously. the middle of their season. <laughs> Well, I think it said October, November, December so, uh, before the season is what the contract says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, they're not scheduled. so there is an out. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yep. Anything else about this item? Okay. Can we have a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve the contract with the Mountaineers. Any discussion? All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, we've approved the Mountaineers MOU. We will, I'll continue to work on finding a date for a city council outing to, uh, to a game. Are you asking for feedback? I'm, I didn't give it to you, so. Oh, yeah, I was, so if you. Just just to get as many people available as possible. But you didn't put out any dates. I didn't, no. Okay. 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 Um, next up, item six, farmer's market update.
All right, you're on. Board of the Farmers Market as a representative of customers. I'm Carrie Pecor. I'm the market manager for Capital City Farmers Market. John, would you like to take it? We uh, wanted to give you an update as to what's been going on at the market for the last year. It's been a really successful year for us, and uh, we're proud of it and uh, pleased with what's happened and uh, excited about the future. I think that it is uh, both an economic and social engine in the city. Uh, I know as somebody who shopped at the market for 45 years now, I had concerns when we moved down the street away from downtown that it would upset things in the city. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, but I don't think it has. So $1.2 million put directly back into the hands of local Central Vermont farmers. Uh, nearly 55,000 customers came through our gates. We have uh, really dedicated volunteers that take attendance for us every week, uh, which we're very thankful for. So, I mean, I think the numbers speak for themselves. The market is growing very quickly. Uh, this year, we already have over 90 approved vendors. So throughout the season, we will probably support more than 100 local producers, uh, which is pretty amazing. And we are open every week, every Saturday, uh, May through October. From nine to one. <laughs> <laughs> so who's coming to the first? Um, oh no. So we'd love to see you all there as often as you can, can be there. I know uh, many of you do shop pretty regularly and uh, we'd love to have you there uh, as often as you're able. One of the things I'm excited about as a, a customer, and I, I, it's a unique position on the board that not only are there producers, uh, farmers, but a customer representative. And I'm not shy, as you well know, uh, those of you who know me. Um, so I'm in there fighting for the customer all the time. And the fact that we, in in the the, the heat of summer, will have 2,500 people come to the market on a Saturday really is amazing. Uh, we're all grateful that we don't have to mask and stand six feet apart anymore. Uh, and I hope we don't have to go back on that at all. Uh, it's become a really wonderful social occasion. Uh, we still do allow dogs as long as they're on a short leash uh, and behave themselves. Uh, we allow children under the same guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> so watch it. <laughs> right. yeah. uh, but it's really delightful to watch people just interact with each other on a Saturday morning. One of the things I wanted to really get a handle on was uh, how does being down past the tax building affect downtown area? Because I don't consider that to be downtown. Uh, and what we find is that a lot of people walk, which is great, uh, and that um, we did a poll with a specific question of, when you come to the market, do you also shop elsewhere? And what we found was nearly 100% of the people do both at the same, on a Saturday morning. So for me, that says we're being successful at being a part of the downtown. And the awesome thing is that it's become a destination market for Vermont. Mm -hmm. So people come from Burlington, people come from all over Vermont just to come to the Montpelier market because the vibe that it has is so different and so unique from most of the other farmers markets in the state. Uh, so it's really become a destination market. And a lot, a lot of those out of towners or a lot of those people from other places in Vermont, when they come to the market, they also then migrate to other businesses downtown. Um, so, yes. Oh, and I want to say thank you so much to the Montpelier Police Department and Fire Department. They are huge supporters of ours, um, as well as state and BGS. So thank you very much. And our, our winter market uh, finishes up this coming uh, Saturday, and we're very thankful to Bar Hill for hosting that. Uh, I don't ever want to have to have a winter market at 133 State Street again, if we can help it. Uh, the lettuce doesn't like it either. So uh, Bar Hill has been a really wonderful supporter and partner in our winter markets. Um, but as Carrie said, uh, 
um, you know, the city has really stood behind us uh, for the, the whole year and we really appreciate it. Any questions? Mike, the question that occurs to me with, with the rate of growth, do you, uh, you have enough room where you are and do you, are you in danger of outgrowing your space? Yes. Yes, uh, and yes, and we're not sure where we would go. It's become, it's such a great space for us, and it has really helped us in the last two years. We moved there in, in 2021. I am a little bit concerned that we're going to outgrow it. Um, the only problem is there's another parking lot there behind where we are, but we, we don't have access to it. I think if we could expand into that lot, we'd be a lot more comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, we just haven't gotten permission to do that. So that would be amazing if we could uh, find a way to work that out. But yeah, I, I'm a little bit concerned if we keep growing at the rate that we are, that we're going to have to figure something out. For instance, already this year, we've had to cut back on the number of nonprofits that can table along the side, mm -hmm. which is a really popular uh, thing. And, and I think in addition to the market as well. Uh, but we just we have to give space to the the vendors, and so we've had to cut back to two a week now. Two. Yeah. Um, so Carrie's working has a great relationship with BGS, and uh, we're working on having access to that whole first quarter, uh, and we don't have it yet. No. And the we've struggled for a long time before I even I even joined the market, but to find a permanent home. Yeah. Uh, so that we never have to move again. We would love for it to be at 133 State, but uh, it'd be really important. It's, it can kill a market to have to move, and we've moved twice in the last three years. Um, so to find a permanent home would be amazing. Obviously, that's very difficult to find a large enough space for us in downtown, um, but we're always working on it. We're always, if anybody has any ideas, we're always open. <laughs> well, and I was going to ask, what can we do to help you get that additional space? Oh, Do we know anybody in buildings? You. I love that. <laughs> uh, I would love to chat with anybody that would be willing to work with us on it. So is is it a matter of BGS just not being willing to open up another parking lot? Yes. I, I, I'm not going to speak poorly of them because Deb and, Deb and I have a wonderful relationship and I, I have never gotten a real clear answer, I don't think, on the reasoning for it. Um, I believe, I, I honestly don't know. I don't know why we haven't been able to use it. Yeah, I believe I've seen some other correspondence about not BGS not allowing vendors of any kind on state property. So that it's, that's not it? But, I mean, this is a state, where we are is a state of okay. law. And we were actually allowed, permitted to do our Thanksgiving market on the state house lawn hmm. uh, two years ago, uh, which was amazing. But I'm not sure. So we we have been told that we have to leave access to that lot because the commissioner might need to come in and out. Um, but as to why we're not able to use those spaces, I'm not sure. Okay. We welcome any help in that regard. Absolutely. <laughs> Anything else? Well, we really appreciate your support. Yeah. And, uh, look forward to seeing you, Mark. Thanks, Thanks for so coming much. in. Thank you so much. And thank your volunteers for taking all this data, <laughs> gathering it. Okay, we're now up to item nine, feast update. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. It's great to be with you. I'm Sarah Lipton. I'm the director at the Montpelier Senior Activity Center, and I'm accompanied by Yolanda James, the Feast Chef Manager. And Paula Mutino, Program Manager. So we're here to tell you a bit more about Feast. We're so grateful and delighted that the Montpelier Senior Activity Center has the great good fortune and honor of being able to run the premier Meals on Wheels program for Montpelier. So we put together some slides for you. And you can see some of our photos in there to sort of showcase, you know, who we've got with us, what we've got going on. Basically, Feast is really focused on providing the necessary nutrition, 
socialization and access to wellness for the older adults in our community. We serve currently about 70, 65 to 70 clients each week. We just restarted the congregate meals in person. And just to give you some perspective, before the pandemic, we had twice a week a congregate meal with about 100 people coming in to eat together for an hour to socialize, often singing, birthday parties, you know, the whole thing. And this is really an important thing that happened before the pandemic and, of course, shifted with the pandemic. So we moved to curbside meals, and we actually just had our last one uh, yesterday because we weren't able to serve all the people, of course, during the pandemic, and now we're able to bring them back inside. So we're really, really pleased for that. We are also extremely proud to not only be a Meals on Wheels America member, which gives us access to things like grants and resources and other kinds of, um, I don't know, connections that happen. Um, Shalanda was able to go to their conference last year, and besides bringing back COVID, also brought back a lot of really good information. Um, but we're also really proud to be working inside the community services de department with the parks division on their feast farm. So do you want to talk about the farm? Love to. Uh, the farm was created in 2021 and it is a well-organized dynamic place. We just hired a, a farm manager uh, who are really excited about, who brings a wealth of experience in education and working with people of all ages. And um, we are the only state capital with its own farm serving older adults um, as a focus. And of course, it's not limited to older adults. And um, I'm excited about intergenerational programming there. And it's a beautiful place. And we collaborate with the Recreation Department and the Parks Department on curating the space. And stay tuned, we will be inviting you to a harvest dinner in September out there. But in the kitchen. In the kitchen on a daily basis, we have volunteers from all uh, walks of life that come into our kitchen and help prepare the meals for our older adults. We have uh, volunteers from our community justice program. We have the Mount Pillar Senior High School that also comes and volunteers with us. And we just have general uh, community members that are concerned with the well being of our uh, older adults and making sure that they get the nutritional value um, that they need for um, staying healthy, uh, as well as serving a dignified meal to them um, and making sure that they are um, checked on and cared for. And once those meals are cooked up and packaged, they are delivered by an awesome group of volunteer drivers. We have about 30 drivers who come in every what, more than more than 30, plus all these substitutes, 50 something so in between 30 and 45. And um, they are uh, they have magical relationships and build relationships slowly. Some of our uh, drivers have been driving for 30 years um, and really take care of the older adults and people with disabilities in our community uh, through building rapport with them and checking on them, going above and beyond. Um, and so we know that everybody who's on our list is getting a four times a week check-in and um, we're proud of that. So we wanted to talk a little bit about why Feast. So as you're probably aware, and this is maybe some older data from I think the, the last census of 10 years ago or so, there are about 1,600 older adults in Montpelier. And our program serves beyond just Montpelier. We serve Meals on Wheels in Berlin. Our meal, our congregate meals and our former curbside meals were open to anybody. Anybody could come. That's a lot of older adults. And just looking at the, the data in our county, 20% of older adults are over 65 and 7% of them live in poverty. That's just, that's numbers I found from state documents. So our meals are not just necessary because some people can't cook. They're necessary because older adults deserve access to food. So in FY23, this current year, we will have served, we are serving over our 
contracted amount, but we're serving 20,000 meals. We're working to inch back down to our contracted amount. Um, but part of the increase, can you still hear me? Sound, okay, the sound keeps changing. Um, part of our challenge of the last couple of years with the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic was an increased need. Um, one of the shifts that happened during the pandemic and now has shifted back is that the eligibility requirements changed during the pandemic. Basically, the doors opened wide. So anyone over the age of 60 who needed access to a meal for whatever reason was able to get one. And so that combined with the fact that you all allowed me to create a kitchen manager chef position and hired Shalanda here, who started making really amazing meals, our program grew a lot and it grew too much. And so we're in the process of shrinking it back down. And part of that that's helping us in that is also really painful from a human services standpoint is that the eligibility requirements just on um, April 1st have returned to pre-pandemic requirements of the necessity of an older adult who is homebound. So they can't necessarily get out. They, they can't actually cook a meal for themselves. They can't get to the grocery store. So they really need that meal. So we're working really hard with our staff and our volunteers to do reassessments of all of our clients. We have, again, we have 65 to 70 clients right now. So it's, it's quite of an undertaking, um, but we're working to really reassess who actually needs those meals and who, who can we sort of shift over and say, hey, come to your congregate meal or who can we start selling meals to? And so that's one of the things that we're working on. Is there anything else on this slide you wanna talk about? Yeah, all right. All of you are invited warmly to come to a congregate meal. I believe tomorrow's menu, it's Thursdays from 12 to 1, is shepherd's pie. Chicken pot pie. Chicken pot pie. There we go. There we go. The other favorite. <laughs> so just, you've already met our people. We also have a part-time kitchen assistant, Robbie Plunkett. And again, we have an incredible array of intergenerational volunteers. So do you want to talk a little bit about our farm volunteers? More than you did? Yes. Um, we have, ex we, uh, excuse me, sorry. Um, we have people who come to the farm from the youth from the VYCC, Vermont Youth Conservation Corps. Montpelier. Montpelier's Youth Conservation, thank you. Um, uh, as well as U32 students. Um, there are, it's, it's a wide landscape um, of people who are drawn to the farm. Um, and it's, uh, what else can I say about that? Jump in. Um, we also, last year and the year before, we were able to run some uh, camps out on the farm. So there were younger kids out there as well. And then in the kitchen, as Shalanda already said, we have um, a really incredibly diverse array of volunteers coming in, which includes not just the high school and middle school, we do have a middle school student, but also um, students from the new school and other sort of organizations that they come in with their attend attendance. So we have an incredibly diverse bunch of folks and it's just, it's a really vibrant and happy place to be. And we're super grateful. We had not only Audra Brown from the planning department, but we also had our new chief of police in there yesterday chopping up cabbages. <laughs> so I just wanted to shout out, we have an incredible amount of community support for this program. Um, we certainly have our contract with the Central Vermont Council on Aging to be able to provide those meals. And I'll give you a little more financial context in just a moment. Um, the National Life Group has been a really, um, their foundation has been a great supporter of Feast over the years. We're waiting with bated breath on a <laughs> grant that we just applied for, so hopefully that'll come through. AARP Vermont provided us with a grant last year to start our first Feast farm stand, and that will be happening again this summer, selling produce at a very low cost to anyone who needs access to really high quality produce, not to take away from the farmer's market at all. It's on Wednesday mornings. Um, and anyone can come by. Um, so that's, we're really happy to be having that. Um, Hunger Mountain Co-op is currently doing a give change um, program for us right now. So they've raised, I don't know, about a thousand dollars just from people rounding up at the till, which is kind of mind blowing. Um, and then recently we did our big March for Meals campaign. This is an annual opportunity in March. The entire country celebrates National Meals on Wheels Awareness Month. And so we do a big March for Meals campaign, and we did an astounding job this year. We raised over $17,000 from the community and from many of the sponsors that you see listed. Um, and that included a really exciting silent auction with a lot of donations. So just to give a little financial context to our program, it is one of the programs at MSAC. And the feast budget of MSAC represents only about... Uh, 
think seven or eight percent of our entire budget. But the feast budget itself is primarily, as you can see, um, that the largest chunk comes from our contract with the Central Vermont Council on Aging. We receive it's pretty static. It's it hasn't changed for a few years, but we receive three dollars and eighty cents per meal served within our contract, and our contract is fourteen thousand five hundred meals. So as I mentioned, we're serving over that, and we're working to make up the difference. And I'll mention, we've been redoing our meal cost analysis quite in depth. Our meals actually cost about $14.40. And that's if you figure in staff costs and you know all the different things that go into making a meal. Um, so we're super grateful for that $3.80 um, from Central Vermont Council on Aging, but obviously it's not enough. So that's why we work with all of the other pieces that we have um, to work with, with fundraising grants, the donations that we seek, the sponsorships that we work with, the meal donations that come directly from recipients um, and fundraising events. So it's there's a lot in there. What's up? And yeah, community. Oh, yes, right. So we also, and I should have put them on the sponsor slide. Oh, no, I don't know what happened. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Um, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, Shalanda just reminded me, we have another wonderful partner, which is the Community Harvest of Central Vermont. They are a gleaning, our local gleaning program, and we receive between five and 10,000 pounds of free produce from them. So that helps us keep our, our bottom line a little bit lower, as does the farm produce from um, our Feast Farm. So last year, I think we brought in about 5,000 pounds of produce from the Feast Farm. And if you do the numbers, that does really help. Um, to keep our costs low, as well as allowing us to provide locally sourced meals. I can pause it. Are there any questions about any of this so far? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. While we're talking about the finances, when uh, when I was on the board of the Housing Authority, you know, I have a meals program over there too. Yep. My recollection was that we could uh, we were allowed to have a suggested donations yes. for meal recipients, but nobody could be correct denied even if they paid nothing or, and yep. is that the same, same that's thing? correct yeah um and and the big difference with what they're doing and what we're doing is that um we are preparing our meals to the older americans act standards and so we do receive the funding through the council on aging they are not doing that and so they're not getting that funding but um and that's probably because they didn't want to do as high quality of meals um but the the way that that works is we we definitely do not invoice for our meals. They If someone can't pay, they still get the meal, but we do request donations and they do come in. We do have some members who are really able to offer and some who really can't. And that's kind of by design, but that's Thanks. just part of the program. Yeah, thank you for that question. I had a related question yeah. to that because when you said 23,000 and your contracted for 14. 20,000, 20, not 23. Okay, 20, yeah. Yeah. Well, you said you were serving 23. Okay, 20,000. Yeah. So 20,000. Yep. It's still yep. 6,000 meals. And do they fall under the heading Jack was talking about that you can't turn people away or? Yep. So, um, yes. And a couple of things about that. So, we, that, that growth kind of happened very quickly. And the, Last year, um, the Council on Aging still had ARPA funds, and they were able to reimburse us for our overages. So we received a check, I think, in November for $17,000 that covered a lot of last year's overages. This year, we're working really hard to reduce our numbers because we are not uh, getting a guarantee of that ARPA funding. I, don't, I think they used it all last year. So we won't get that, and that's why we've been working extra hard on the fundraising campaigns searching and applying for many, many grants, and also really working to reduce the number of meals that we're serving. Taking away the curbside meal helps us a little bit. It takes away meals from some folks who rely on them for that service, but we're inviting them in for the uh, congregate meals. So it's it's a bit of a juggle balance. So that's a federal requirement of your program that you can't turn anybody away? Correct. So are you able to keep splitting the beans? Uh, to, We're working I mean, on it. I mean, at some point, that just yeah. amazes me that yeah. you're required to, and yeah, that can be a pretty big number. It's, you, it's challenging, but again, we we do regularly, I think monthly, when we send out a letter we month, to our recipients, we ask, we say to anyone, everyone, you know, here's how many meals you've received. If you're able, please send in a donation. And a lot of people do, and we're working to sort of raise the awareness in the community of recipients about that. 
but it's definitely not something we can push. And there, I mean, I've done a ton of these deliveries myself. I've been in these people's houses and they are really in need of these meals and lots more support than, than we can offer. So it it is a, this is part of the trick of what we're doing is that it is a real deep, n- deeply needed community service that is underfunded and will probably always be underfunded. And so we work extra hard to make these sponsorship relationships. We're working to find sponsors for our farm stand this summer, and that will help bring in a little bit extra. We're working to, um, we're, and I'm about to show you what we're, some of the things we're, so how are we going to split those beans? <laughs> but I saw another question over here. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, along the same lines, you, uh, you mentioned that the eligibility requirements changed as of April 1st. Yes. So it's restricted to people who are homebound. Yep. Um, do you have any sense of um, what the actual need is? Like how many homebound older adults there are who are going to need meals and will you be able to meet that? And then is there any room in the future for a renegotiated contract with the council on aging or, you know, is that something that's set at the federal we level? sure hope there is. <laughs> Um, yeah, so a few things. So we have, um, oh, now my head's spinning with the two different questions you asked. What was the first question you asked? Well, uh, it was about, uh, do you have a sense of what the actual need is? Yes, thank you. Homebound yeah, yeah. so um, we have been kind of looking at that when we're doing these reassessments and getting the res- results back. And the Council on Aging is helping us to navigate that and, and look through them and sort of really make sure this is a person who really needs that meal um, or not, for instance. So It's a hard question to answer because part of the challenge of what we provide is that there's a lot of stigma against asking for help. So I know for a fact, and I told you that number, 1,600 older adults, I know for a fact there's a great many more people that probably need meals than will ever reach out and ask for them. So one of the factors of coming on to Meals on Wheels is you have to self-determine that you need and want them. Not want, but you need them. And so that kind of takes away a portion of the population that probably would really benefit from receiving meals. And it, in an inverse way, helps us because we can't afford to serve them all anyway. So I think in this period of time that we're doing this reassessment, we're going to be seeing the amount of folks come off that we need to, to be back down in our number range that we need to be in. I also think, as I'll tell you in a minute, um, we're going to get to, an, we're, we're installing a new process so that we can begin to make some income off of a different type of meal so that we can ultimately, as we're able to grow again, to serve as many as are needed. Um, Your second question was if CVCOA can ever uh, renegotiate, we hope so. You know, they're certainly aware of the need in our community. There's, you know, we're in touch with them constantly and they see that, you know, they have case managers who work with a lot of our same clients. So they certainly see the need and they know that our program has grown and is growing. The challenge, of course, is that the federal funding just stays really static. So that's, that is the challenge. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. So positioning for growth. <laughs> um, we are looking at transitioning to a revenue model. We're looking at sort of two different ways to do this primarily. Um, We have um, our chef here has been trained in producing medically tailored meals. Would you like to define what that means? So that means we're providing a nutritional meal that is specific to someone's health needs, such as someone who has low sodium or they are diabetic. They might have an allergy that we're making sure that we're pertaining to the guidelines that we were trained on so that they can be able to have that meal. So this is something that is being done around the country. Um, In fact, our guide in this process is the nutrition coordinator um, or nutrition director at the Council on Aging. And she actually has a medically tailored meals business in Washington, D.C. They sell meals for $35 a meal. We probably can't do that here, but she does really well. And so she's helping us to figure this out. And the Lamoille County Meal Program is doing this already. Um, And they've contracted with their local hospital to sell, I think it's 100 meals a month. Um, I think they're charging $11 a meal. And so it's bringing in a teeny tiny little bit of income for them. And because of where we are and how much more population there is here and how many more services there are here in our region, we feel pretty sure that we can produce more than that and sell more than that. So we're working on our business plan right now um, to develop that and feel like that'll be a really helpful way to bring in. It's not going to be a huge lift for the the kitchen. It's really just 
basically making more of some of the meals we already make, packaging it slightly differently, and then offering it out for sale and doing some of the marketing. Um, we're also looking at um, the idea of bringing some of our clients who currently receive meals, but who are soon maybe going to be ineligible. We can start to sell them meals if they're able to pay for them. And if that's something that we can do with them. So they would no longer be a Meals on Wheels recipient through that subsidized pathway, but we would actually have a fee for service. Um, we also, of course, are doing special events. We're going to be um, cooking at Park Palooza this summer. Um, and we've got our Feast Farm stand, as I mentioned, and we might be thinking about doing a little bit of catering here and there. Um, we're, of course, continuing to look for more sponsorship um, through Meals on Wheels America. There are corporate sponsorships that are available. So that's something we're investigating. And due to the overwhelmingly positive support from the community in March, we feel like there might be some more local sponsors that would be interested in being engaged as well. Um, and of course, the team is really working hard on grants always. Um, so that's basically, you know, kind of how we're able to think, okay, we can keep going, you know, and we can actually bring this forward and continue. And that's basically it. I've got some, you know, pictures to show you. This was from our farm stand last year. We had Alec there playing the fiddle. <laughs> farm stand's really, really sweet. It's going to be on Wednesday mornings from 9 to 1030, and we'll have music and other engagement at those. A lot of good produce. We've got just an incredible amount of volunteers in the kitchen. If you ever want to come roll up your sleeves, it is actually a good time. <laughs> and of course, the farm, you definitely don't want to miss going out there. It's out at the old Two Rivers farm spot behind Agway. It's really beautiful what they've done out there. We will not be doing chickens again, though. I don't know if you heard about the chickens. <laughs> um, but we will be doing more harvest dinners and other big events. That went really well last year. Really good time getting a lot of people out there. A couple of years ago, you probably heard um, Senator Sanders was out there and um, he loved it. So we have guest chefs that come in at times to do the meals and congregate with all of our people. Any other questions, anyone? Thanks a lot. Any other questions from members of the council? Yeah. Palin. If you wanna come and uh, volunteer, uh, how, ooh. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> How uh, can we contact? Is there like, oh, I I am coming and getting like some um, appointment? I don't know how to, yeah. I'm your point person. Okay. So people can stop by, talk to me, email me, call me. Um, my information is on the website. And then I will, we do have a volunteer application and okay, orientation. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we have orientations every two weeks on Wednesday mornings, every two weeks from 11 to 12. And then we'll work with your schedule and see when do you want to come in? Uh, okay, I want to ask another question. Actually, so you said you have to um, cook your food based on specific criteria. Yep. Do you cook like international cuisine? Yes. Oh, great! Yes, I do try to offer a very wide variety of um, different meals, um, such as what's the last one? The chicken tiki mar masala that we offered um, went over very well. And then what else did we do? We just recently did um, a chickpea taco. So it's it's like we try to involve, you know, um, very much so meat, the meat and potatoes that everyone likes, but we also like to do those international dishes as well. Maybe we can have a, I don't know, competition or something, event like send your international meal recipe and then we can create like a special meal for Montpelier or something like that. It will be cool to make our town more uh, international and global. I bet most of the people have their grandparents' recipes somewhere from all around the world, right? It will be Thank cool. You. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We also have meatless Mondays. <laughs> you have a special meal coming up, don't you? Well, quite a few, in fact. <laughs> well. Uh, but you sent an email. Yes, yes. So we have um, on, well, on May 11th, we're going to do a Mother's Day brunch. Um, and then May 25th, we're doing a Veterans Recognition Luncheon. Yep. yep. And that's really special. Um, in the past, we had over 100 people coming in. Many counselors, the mayor, and other leaders in the community would come to that. And of course, we haven't had it in person since the pandemic. So this is our first time in person again. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much. It's really an honor to be able to present to all of you. And I'm so proud to share my staff. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming.
next up we have the East State Street construction. Sorry, Kate. <laughs> East State Street construction presentation. Where are you? Actually, I'm. Is it? Am I missing something? Oh no, Kate, you are up. I'm sorry. I have the wrong uh, wrong version of this. Yeah. <laughs> Jack. Yeah, you've been using the wrong. Uh, yes. The, the agenda I'm seeing also has um, appointments to the DRB that w was earlier in the agenda. Yeah, and, and I thought so too. <laughs> and I'm not seeing it on the agenda that I. Uh, okay. Well, I suggest we do the DRB. Appointment. Now, okay, I, thank you. Um, uh, because we because they got skipped, so we have two uh, appointments to the uh, development review board, um, and they are reappointments or at reapplications of uh, John Lazerchak and. I reviewed the other one, so, who? and Kevin O'Connell. And I don't see them here or online. I'd like uh, to make a motion that we reappoint them. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you so much for, uh, for that reminder. Okay, now, hey, yes. Well, this is very, very odd. So I'm glad, glad of the. Uh... So um, my name is Kate Stevenson. I'm a volunteer member of the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. Um, I'm not, I'm no longer the chair. So I must have recycled this slide from previous year. And then I'm here with Chris Lumbra the facilities and sustainability coordinator for the city. So um, since I know we have a number of new, newer counselors um, and we typically do this update once a year to city council, I just wanted to give a little bit of history and context about the energy advisory committee, get you all up to speed about what we've been working on. Um, then we're gonna go into the presentation of the municipal energy information, the metrics that we've been collecting um, for the past fiscal year. And then I'm going to hand it over to Chris to talk about the um, some updates around district heat and take your questions. So that's the plan. So the city, as you hopefully know, the city has um, committed to a goal of net zero. And the way that we define that is um, eliminating fossil fuel use by converting to 100% renewable energy. Uh, so that's the what we're measuring. Um, and the commitment is by 2030 that 100% of the municipal energy used for thermal, electric, and transportation will be renewable or offset. And then by 2050, that we will eliminate fossil fuel use um, throughout the entire community, which includes homes and businesses, as well as, as municipal. But today's presentation is really going to be very focused on the, muni the municipal side of things. Um, so within our committee, we have four, four different working groups, um, planning and policy, residential, transportation, and municipal. Oops, wrong direction. Okay. Um, so some of the residential projects that we've been working on include um, the window dressers, which is a, a volunteer thing we do in the fall to build um, interior storm window inserts. A couple of years ago, we did a weatherization campaign. We've worked to do outreach to owners of multifamily buildings, rental properties, um, promoting modern wood heat, the button up campaign with Efficiency Vermont, and, um, and we've done some different home tours. On the municipal side, um, we helped put together a one megawatt municipal solar project. Uh, we've done retro commissioning of a number of uh, municipal buildings. We created a revolving loan fund to help fund some of the efficiency projects. We've done extensive 
energy audits of the municipal buildings and um, worked on the district heat and the wastewater plant project, organics to energy project to support that. On the policy side, um, working on the net zero resolution, which was first adopted in 2014 and then updated in 2018. Um, in 2021, we completed a net zero action plan. We worked with VEIC as a consultant to help us really outline the details of what we need to do over the next seven years to hit those 2030 goals. Um, we also last year um, approved the home energy disclosure ordinance, which is basically a time of sale ordinance asking anyone who's listing their property for sale to disclose its energy use. Um, and we've been working with the planning department to contribute to the, the energy plan part of the city plan. And on the transportation side, um, we have definitely had less activity there in the last few years, but um, we worked on the helping support the, the rollout of My Ride by GMT. Um, we're now been working on looking at locations for more EV chargers around the city and um, Previously, we, we contributed to the car share pilot program. So again, this is just like a little bit of history that the, the committee itself was started in 2010. Really, it was the district heat project that kind of got that going. Um, and then we had some big moves, you know, in terms of our solar project and the district heat project coming online. Um, and I think one of the most exciting things that's happened in the last couple of years, um, both as the phase one work at the wastewater treatment plant, which is which is a big win for our move to renew renewable energy, um, and being able to bring Chris on board as a as a staff person to support our net zero efforts is huge. So we're excited, and that has helped move many different projects along in the last six months. So let's just talk a little bit about um, FY22. So this is the fiscal year that ended last June 30th. So this, you know, it takes us a while to collect all the data. And this is just going back through like all the electric bills, all the oil propane bills, um, looking at all the fuel used by the city's fleet. Um, and I wanna give a big shout out to Todd Proventure in the finance office, um, who was the one that did all the legwork, finding all of the bills and collecting the bills. And so um, he and I, we've collaborated for, for a number of years now, <laughs> pulling all this data together and I get to put it into the fun graphs, but he, um, he populated the spreadsheet this year, which I was very grateful for. Um, so, one of the big things that's different about this, those of you who were here for the presentation last year, um, this, this chart was flipped. We were at 43% renewable, and um, this year we are at 57% uh, renewable energy for the municipal energy use. Um, and there are a couple of reasons why, but let me, I'll go to the next, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of show you some more fun graphs to try and tell that story a little bit. So when we, again, we're looking at three different types of energy, the, um, the big blue part is thermal, and that also includes um, biogas produced and used at the wastewater treatment plant, which is a big chunk of that. Um, and then the next is electric, and the smaller chunk is the fleet, uh, diesel and unleaded gas. And so we have been tracking this data since, since fiscal year 11, 2011. Um, and you can kind of see how these different bars have changed over time. And you might see a big jump in, uh, in FY22 in the blue section. Um, really, the other two sections stayed pretty much flat. Um, the bump in FY22 really came from the biogas at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, so two things. One is with the improvements that we've made at the plant, we're bringing in more waste. We are producing a lot more, like orders of magnitude more biogas. And we're using that to both heat the buildings and heat the digesters. Um, and in the past, we have not had really good metering tracking of the biogas. We now finally, as of like January, have some good data, but we don't have like a full year's worth of 
new metered data. So we're, we, we still had to extrapolate a little bit and we don't know exactly how much is going to heating and how much is going through the flare. So when they have excess, they flare it. Um, I think next year we'll be, we'll have a much better sense of the percentages of how much is being used for heating and how much is going to the flare. But for now, I've kind of thrown it all in the thermal bucket and it looks like it, there's a lot more. We are using more thermal energy at the wastewater treatment facility than we were before. Good part is it's all renewable energy. So all the biogas is considered in that renewable bucket. So that's part of what our percentage renewable the other direction um, this year, although there were a couple other factors that went into that. So this just kind of charts that those two sides of the coin, right? That the, we were 100% fossil fuel in 2011, and now we're up to 57% this year. And if you really want to get into like, how does that all break out? You know, so I, I separated out, you know, oil at the bottom, and then you got propane, and then you got diesel, and then you got unleaded. So the brownish ones are all the fossil fuel ones, and the, the other colors are the renewable energy. Um, and you see that pink on the top, that's the that's the spike is is all biogas. Um, and you see, you know, I think what I what is useful to show here is, yeah, there is this kind of solid chunk at the bottom, which is number two heating fuel for thermal heating. Um, and then the other thing that that is a little harder to see in this graph is that we're seeing a real change in the electric sector, right? So Green Mountain Power is the utility that covers almost all of Montpelier, but you know they have switched from their fuel being, um, or you know the electricity that we get being um, less renewable. Every year it increases. This past year it was 78% renewable. They're on target to, to be 100% renewable by 2030, if not before. Um, so we've seen a real shift in the, the grid electricity that, all, that changes this mix as, in addition to the solar that the city is producing through its um, solar project. And this is just, we kind of look break down by department, like which departments use the most energy. Um, the blue is renewable, the orange is fossil fuel. So you see a, a lot of little ones and then you see the big spike for the wastewater treatment plant. Um, I did a version without where you took out the wastewater treatment plant just so you can see it a little bit better. Um, but you see, you know, we are we are including the school the, the schools in all of our data because we consider them municipal buildings, even though they are controlled by the school district. Um, but you see, you know, high school and the middle school really standing out. Those those have a lot of fossil fuel use. Um, kind of third in line is, is public works, and that's mostly from the public works fleet. And then um, water plant is really the next big, big item for us to tackle in terms of looking at fuel switching uh, for the heating system. Just another way to look at it, you know, how does this all split out? Again, you see oil, we don't have many buildings using propane, so that's a relatively smaller chunk of the pie. And if you're curious about how the fleet breaks out, um, we did the, just the fleet energy by department, and you see it's two thirds public works, which makes sense. They own, they you know control most of the fleet. That's all the snow plows and um, you know heavy equipment, in addition to to actual vehicles driving around town. And then behind that is police station, um, and then city hall and fire department get combined in all of these graphs, and that's. That's mainly because they're on the same heating system. They're both on district heat and we're, they're not metered separately. And so for the thermal side, we have to kind of lump them together. We lumped them together for this chart too. So just some overall trends. There wasn't anything when Todd and I went and reviewed all of this, there was nothing that jumped out as being really notable other than the biocast. Um, like I said before, the electricity and the fleet energy were pretty flat um, and solar production was down partly um, on our existing arrays, partly because it was just cloudier. Um, but overall, the solar production increased because the school district added a new solar array in FY21. So there was a new uh, source of solar electricity coming into our, um, our stats. And I just wanted to kind of 
bring us back and ground us in the net zero action plan. Um, so it was completed last, I guess, 2021 now, um, where we looked at kind of the path to net zero. And the, the projections that we came up with were that we felt like it was possible to get the city to at least 88% renewable by 2030. Um, with the with the remaining 12%, which is mainly from vehicle fleet that we don't think that we can electrify in the next eight years, seven years. Um, and so that last 12% would probably require some kind of offsets. Um, and the top priorities in the plan are, are really the thermal fuel switching for the high school, the middle school, the water plant, and the DPW garage and, and office. I'm trying to get those off of fossil fuel. Uh, we're really not looking at doing any more electricity production projects. That's partly because, again, Green Mountain Power is on their own path to 100% renewable. And we have also maxed out what we're allowed to net meter. Um, the state has caps on how much you can net meter, and we're already way beyond that. So, um, so we're not lo looking at like where could we put more solar panels. And this just shows kind of where we are in that ten-year trajectory to, to 2030. And I think we're I think we're on track. I think we're we're mm -hmm. kind of where we hoped that we would be. You know, with the projects that we already knew we had in the pipeline. So, what are we working on now? Um, and a lot of these, you know, I think if you have questions, we'll turn it to Chris, but a lot of projects that he's been working on since he started in the fall. Um, we're looking to upgrade the heating system at DPW in the equipment barn, which is where they park all the big trucks um, and replace, potentially replace the slab and the heating system at the same time. Um, and either do that like with a pellet boiler is one of the, the options that we're looking at. Um, you may be aware that, you know, and there, that was it as a budget item that's in this year's budget was at least um, some funding to go towards that may not be enough to do the whole project. And it's not going to happen before the end of this fiscal year, that's for sure. But, um, you know, it's at least we're getting, we're starting to get quotes back and things like that. Um, we also had $50,000 in this year's fiscal fiscal year budget to look at more EV chargers. And so Chris has been um, looking at the locations, potentially some at DPW and some behind the fire station. And then just kind of looking at the overall EV options for fleet upgrades as different vehicles come up for replacement, which are appropriate for EV or plug-in hybrid or hybrid options. Um, so I think there's, there's more to do there, but we're starting the process. Um, we're starting to kind of take deeper into district heat and look at um, new customers, and he'll talk about that. Also, you know, there is a lot of funding coming out through the um, Inflation Reduction Act, and that that's going to trickle down through state programs. And I think that there is going to be money out there, so we want to have our projects as shovel ready as we can. Um, and then we are planning to continue the window dressers project. We're probably going to be doing that in the fall again. Um, so going out and um, visiting homes where we, we have a team that goes and measures the windows. And then we have, we do a week long volunteer, um, volunteer build where we, uh, we do it at the Barry auditorium. Um, and we'll go back there this year, but we'll we basically take these pre-cut um, uh, kits and assemble the windows and have a lot of volunteers come and do that. And it's a lot of fun. So. That's the update. I'll take questions and then I'll hand it over to Chris and he can talk more about district heat. Great report as uh, as usual, Kate. Um, who had what? Starting out, Palin. Uh, so when you show us the energy use by department slide, uh, what is the reason? Like high school, you know. There are some um, departments, uh, they are still using a lot of fossil. Is it the system they are using? Is it the um, budget, like it is too expensive for them? Or are there any other reasons uh, that city can like help to switch? Or it is just by preference, I don't know. You know? <laughs> um, 
Right. So, so the reason is that, the, that both the middle school and the high school are on oil. Um, the union elementary is on the district heat system. So they're on, you know, if you look at their side, it's pretty much 100% renewable. Um, so I think that the good news is that we have made a lot of progress in the last couple of years in starting to have more dialogue with the school district. They, um, they kind of reinvigorated this facilities committee. And so we have a member of MIAC who is um, sitting on the facilities committee. And so more back and forth. Um, they just passed a net zero resolution for the school district last week. Um, so that's you know what we've kind of been nudging towards for many years <laughs> since, since the city um, did their own resolution. So I think that's like the first step is that mm -hmm. then on a policy level to say, this is what we're gonna do. Um, and their resolution is you know, slightly different th than the city's, but basically it's directing the administration to look at how to plan for getting rid of the fossil fuels there. So that's I don't think they have a clear timeline or mm -hmm. a clear plan. Yeah. So is it same with the bus contractor, the bus services for schools? Because that one is only orange. Right. They don't have any blue. Like, uh, So is there any uh, contractor uses this or it's... there? I mean, the electric we are school aware buses something. exist. The school bus contractor that Montpelier uses does not have any electric school buses. So yeah, they're all running on diesel. Okay. Um, and, you know, it's because it's a subcontract, I think they have some limitations on what they can ask for. And, you know, it's not like, oh, just go get a quote from the electric school bus contractor in central Vermont. I mean, there, there isn't another one right now. So, um, yeah, it's, it's something that they're going to have to look at. I don't know. I don't know the details of how they're going to plan to look at that. Yeah, Don. I love all your data, and this is not the most friendly question. I'm sorry, but is there any way to equate some of your data into cost? Because I mean, we know we're doing this for the environment and our health. We need to do this. But I also have this thought about well, what's the cost shift going on here? So that needs a whole other set of data to be compiled and composed. Yes, um, I mean. There's cost and there's also greenhouse gas emissions, which is another piece that we're tracking, although it felt like, yeah, too much to try to put all into the same presentation. So we've just kind of stuck with like um, units of energy. But, um, you know, I have never had any visibility on the costs of what we're paying, or, you know, all of those mm -hmm. bills that 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 we're tracking. Um, I'll look to Kelly for that so in the future. something that... that we, you know, I think we could consider, I think, the, I think that the thing that we should take into account that's more important, um, you know, because certainly there are things that we've done that have saved cost over time. And there are things- I'm not even looking to save. More. I'm just interested yeah. in the data, really. Yeah. Really. Um, I think as we make decisions going forward, if we've made this commitment to be 100% renewable, and we know that it might require some investment in offsets to hit that goal. Then when we're like making a decision between the all electric vehicle and the hybrid vehicle, and you say, well, you know, we just can't afford the all electric one. You know, we should also be considering not only the operating cost of that vehicle over its lifespan, but what offsets might we have to buy to, to, to kind of cover the no, fuel right. that we're going to be purchasing for that um, fossil fuel vehicle. So, that I don't think we've gotten that sophisticated in our analysis, uh, you know, cost analysis when we're looking at some of these investments um, to be able to, I don't, yeah, get really deep into what what offsets cost, and it is a moving target to try to anticipate what what yeah. they're going to cost in 2030. Um, and it's not an area of my expertise, but I think yeah, starting to kind of like bring that analysis in when we're looking at the life cycle costs of these investments is going to be important. Well, and to budget to understand that even renewables are going to go up in costs, but it may not be the same as what we've experienced with fuels. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, both Chris, you and Chris. Uh, Kate, I have a question about the uh, the disclosure ordinance. Yeah. Is there anything, I, I know this is a hard thing to say, well, 
here, here's the data, but is there anything we can say say about the uh, the uh, product performance so far? This came up in our last. I think we don't have any data yet to report. Um, I think we're we're going to try and figure out if we can come up with, you know, after we look at a whole a whole year of um, it being in effect. So uh, July one is will be the one year anniversary of when that ordinance went into effect with the, um, it was like a year of no penalty and then it was a year of- And it was mandatory, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mandatory. Um, yeah, so I think we'd love to try to collect that and come back with more information, but I don't think, you know, Chris has had the chance to really get into the enforcement of it or, or get into the weeds of how many people are actually disclosing. Yeah, and is it working? You know, what is it influencing behavior? Uh, I don't know. It's it's also a weird thing because it it came into effect while we we're in a very distorted real estate market. Yeah. Uh, Tim, I do have personal experience with it because we try to help our clients comply. Um, it's it is interesting. We have a lot of older myself included, you know, technologically challenged people in my player. And, and that seems to be a big issue with just doing it. I can't tell you how many people we've had to get a son or a daughter or even us to help them fill it out online because they just don't. And, and the other thing that's really awkward with it, if you're doing analysis or trying to make improvements is, so you go through and you do this, your home energy profile, and then like no one else has access to it it's not available electronically. So the person who does it has to really print it off and provide it to their real estate agent or their attorney or whoever's helping them with their transaction. It seems like if you're doing it online, it should be available electronically. It's I mean, not. It is as a PDF. No one that I've worked with has found out how to do that. And there's okay. quite a few people that have tried. Yeah. I so mean, it's not easy. The missing yeah. And even if you have the PDF, you know, how do you attach it to the listing? Like, there was a lot of conversation initially about them and scan them, right MLS, now. And, you know, how there's going to be a field where you can attach it in MLS, but like that has not happened um, as far as I can tell. And you probably <laughs> are more familiar with how that all works, but yeah, yeah I think, I think that the, um, there are a variety of challenges with the implementation. Yeah, but that's probably the, maybe the easiest one to fix because it's, I think, technologically and in-house. And then after that, let's see how people do with it. But the properties I've seen it prepared on some, it seems like a meaningful estimation of what we know it really costs for those properties for energy and others you look at and go, it's fiction because it's just an algorithm. Anybody, Lauren. Thanks. Um, first, Kate and Chris, thank you so much. Uh, I know Chris will hear from you in a minute, um, but having Chris on board has been amazing to try to actually move the projects forward. So really grateful for the investment that the city made to do that. Um, you know, as someone who works on climate change in my day job and spends a lot of time with the like the international reports saying we've got catastrophe coming if we don't act and that we've, you know, it's political will that is the thing stopping us. We have the technologies. So it's just really exciting to be able to in our community, be seeing how, how do we, in reality, do our part and on the ground, make it work for a community. And so I just like love MEAC's ability to like roll up the sleeves and just be like, okay, this is how we switch our buildings. And this is how we switch our fleet and like really just try to make it work. So I think it's just, it's great. And we've got some um, great new people on MEAC right now who just joined, who have a lot of expertise and energy. So I think that's great, including Sal. Um, so really uh, optimistic and also just noting, um, Kate mentioned it, but with the federal incentive programs that just came online, there really are huge opportunities. And so there's gonna be opportunities for, I think local governments like ours, but also a ton of opportunities for our community members. So I know th one thing that we talked about also was how does MIAC help our community members find out about um, what's gonna be coming online for people that are a lot of tax incentives for, you know, installing a heat pump or, you know, all these various things. And so I think there's going to be just a ton of great chances for people to make their homes more efficient, uh, more affordable. Um, 
and, and cleaner. So I think that will be great too. And hopefully we'll have a role in helping people find out how to do that and, and access all of that. So I think it's an exciting time. <laughs> Yeah. One more to bother you for just, and maybe it ends up being a question for city finance, but as we look at the warrants that we review and we sign off on, uh, one thing I've noticed as a new member is one of the items that appears regularly is a $10,000 payment for solar. So are we paying roughly 10000 a month for some solar lease? I'm just curious as to how that equates to what we're saving. Kelly, do you want to say that? So I can, yes, it is in there and I can get you the details on exactly what that goes towards for sure Thanks. i can say that the i don't know why this is not working someone's not muted it seemingly maybe it was working oh, I, think, okay. I think we're good now ah that's better um so the, just so you're the the solar arrays that that the city is in it's part of a power purchase agreement. So it's a um, 20 something year agreement. I know you just talked to them, but um, so we have an agreement to purchase power from this 500 kilowatt array. One of them is in Montpelier, one of them's in Sharon. And um, so, yeah, we, we buy the power from them at a discounted rate that's in this long-term contract. Okay, we you move to any oh Gary. Sorry. No. Um I, no I don't problem. I don't need a whole answer to this right now, but I'm just noticing that there's the goal of uh net zero in municipal operations 2030 and then residential by 2050. And I don't um I I'm I'm just scanning the plan and it seems to all be really focused on municipal. And I'm just wondering what the is there a plan for a plan or you know what what <laughs> steps will be there. <laughs> to work on the action plan it was like well we we did get a um an allocation from city council i think we spent thirty thousand dollars to get some consulting support to put that together and um we made a strategic decision to focus to to do a plan for the muni municipal and like really focus towards that 2030 goal with the with the notion that we would have to come back and do another planning process for the the larger 2050 goal and yeah, I don't know when when that should start. I mean, it should be started. We should do it as soon as we can, but um, haven't talked about that recently. Thanks. It's a it's definitely a bigger nut to crack if yeah. we can get going. Yeah. On it. Lauren, but just on that, I mean, part of why I'm really interested in looking at how MIEC can help support the community by education around like these incentives and things is because we do have that parallel goal. Yeah. And I, I'm hoping through that work, we're identifying like, what are the barriers that our community members are finding to accessing them? So then we can be looking at, you know, are there city policies or city, you know, is it like layering some other small incentive from the city would get people over the hump to be able to install things or something. So I'm hoping that we can do some learning through that. I mean, we'll need a more formal plan, but just the other thing to note too, is the state has a 2050 net zero goal. So this is gonna be happening also coming from the state level and there's state investments and state policies happening and all of that. So it's not like we're alone. So the municipal pieces are the things that absolutely won't happen unless we're doing the investments and making it happen. Um, but I do think we do have a role in helping our community members also kind of figure out how to be part of this transition. Hey, any more questions or are you ready to move to Chris? All right, Chris, you're on. All right. Um, so um, District H has quite a bit of capacity left in it, and it's um, in order to make the most of this thing, we've got to get more people on it, um, and we're we're taking several steps to try and make that happen. Next slide. Um, so District Heat operates. October 1st through May 1st, there are currently 18 buildings connected. Um, and there, there's kind of kind of best guess, guess best guesstimate is around 50% of the capacity is currently being used. Next slide, please. So um, 
we are trying to lure, lure new or entice new customers. Um, and we've recently provided a reasonably detailed rough estimate for a new customer, uh, St. Augustine's Church, um, at their request. And we're kind of awaiting their review and response to that. To that then that would, uh, they'd be a, a really great addition. They're, they're fairly close to existing lines behind City Hall here, and they'd be a big user. So promising there, but we're waiting for their response and to work with them. Did we, did we miss, miss a whole slide here? Um, was there one previous to that? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we have applied, or, Sorry. Yeah, we have applied for um, congressional directed fund funding of a million five fifty thousand dollars, uh, and that does require a hundred percent match of non federal funds in order to to use that funding. And it's our intention that that we would use that to incentivize the connection costs for new users. Uh, so we would use that as fifty percent and the. the User supplied money would be the 50% match that's required. Next slide. Yes, yeah. Um, and we are working with our current customers to improve their usage of the system um, and hopefully help them increase their efficiency, which would free up even more capacity for additional connections or other projects. Other projects. One one possibility is a snow melter that would. Uh, so these are these are devices. They're they're used in a lot of big cities where they don't have snow storage. They don't have the ability to truck the snow. They they fuel fired devices that melt the snow and send it down the drain system. Kind of on site. And they're portable trailer mounted things that use just a, a whole bunch of typically propane, but sometimes oil. Um, we are we're kind of researching the idea of building a kind of a centrally located one of these. It's in a fixed location, obviously it can't be portable, connected to district heat. Um, and we we really need a partner for this. We uh, we approached BGS. They're they're not currently willing to commit to partner on this, um, but we've got a couple a couple large. Uh, private users that we hope to maybe partner with, but nothing, nothing real concrete on that front yet. Um, so using the snow melter is going to reduce our trucking, reduce our labor, shorten the time of of snow removal. This is this primarily for snow removal operations downtown that happen at night. Uh, because it happens at night, it should be it should kind of coincide with a low ebb in in usage. But won't it won't affect building use of the of the district heat capacity, um, and once the snow is melted, then it can be sent to the treatment plant where the runoff can be treated, oil, salt, all that type of stuff will be removed from it, and, and you know, kind of looking to the future, um, DPW has led me to believe that some of this stuff may very well be mandated at the state level that we that it's for it's a requirement you know all municipalities are going to have to start to treat their their snow instead of dumping it on the, on the river banks and letting it run in next slide please yeah okay and this one i've already yeah, yeah. yeah already hit this one thanks chris um do we have questions from the council Um, I, I have a question. Now, am I right that uh, the people that if you're a, a building on district heat that you're you're still paying more than you would if you were just heating it with the uh, with oil? Unfortunately, that's that's almost always the case. Yeah. yeah. You know, I I was I was a huge supporter of. Uh, the district heat plan, but when it was being considered, but it's but it seems like that's probably the major hurdle, right? It is, it really is. So, and you know, in, in 
improving the efficiencies again will free up capacity, but it, it's they and it will kind of create equity across users that their their bill will be more directly related to their usage. Uh, kind of earlier in district heat. And a lot of this is kind of behind us. There's still room for some more more tweaking, but um, there were some smaller users who who really weren't using the system properly. And it, it functioned very differently than the systems that people are used to, the, the, the fuel fired boilers, that type of thing. Um, and it took the it took the people installing the control systems a while to kind of figure out how to how to tune this system for maximum efficiency because of that difference from fuel fired stuff. Uh, but there, uh, historically, there were some users whose, whose bill was really out of scale with their actual usage. Uh, a lot of that's been taken care of, but there is still room for improvement. Thanks, Donna. And, and would that uh, smooth out with more customers sharing the overarching Absolutely. cost, right? That, just like our water bills. That, the more that, customers we have, the less we all pay individually. That's absolutely so what is it going to take? Um, to get more customers, we're we're kind of turning over. Got any carrots? Bushes. And, um, again, the 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 money that we've applied for from Senator Sanders would be used to incentivize new connections. Um, hopefully, that that that's enough to kind of tip the scales and get get some more people on. Is it uh, is it an incentive if if you've got a building that's at the end of uh, useful life for their heating plant, so they're they're faced with you know putting twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars into a new furnace versus signing on with us. Is that one of the things that you're seeing? Oh, hopefully that it, that does kind of help tip the scales as well. You know they, they've already got to make a substantial investment. To, why not put that towards district heat one? One big plus of district heat is that you don't have an in-building heating plant that you have to maintain and, and service year after year after year. Right? And that, that is, you know, on its way as soon as you put it in towards obsolescence. Tim. Uh, we have one building, and as you know, Chris, of the 18 on the list, but um, it, it seems like the cost piece is probably a big decision for people, but there are a number of buildings in town that are looking like they're gonna have renovation projects. So hopefully if we could tie on new users in areas where lines already exist, I would think that would be really helpful because the, the network of distribution lines is pretty tight, isn't it? One, no. Yeah. Um, and one other, one kind of stumbling block that the system faces is, is the season of operation. Um, is at odds with the, with the um, Vermont Department of Health Rental Housing Code. Um, uh, rent. Rental buildings are required to be heated anytime the temperature drops below 55 degrees outside. And, you know, prior to October 1st, that can happen. And after May 1st, it can happen. Mm -hmm. So there's, if, if it's a rental housing building, then they still need some, some kind of provisions for the shoulder seat. Really. Um, so that, that's a tricky piece as well. It is. Is there a map of the network? That Distribution network. I, I haven't really looked for one. I, I thought there might be an easy way to get at it. There, there are maps of it. I, I can't tell you at the moment. Okay, where you can find them. I'll, I'll, I'll catch up with you. Yeah, good. Just one thing to put out there too. I think when we think about different ways to incentivize new users, I mean the upfront cost of connection. I mean we're we're talking tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars for some of these buildings. And like, if there was a way that we could help those customers finance that or amortize it over time and not have to pay it all up front. I mean, I think what Chris is talking about in terms of the, the um, you know, congressional appropriation that would allow us to subsidize part of it would be great. You know, if we can find outside funding to help just lower the cost, but if we could also have a, have a financing mechanism or at least direct people to, Maybe it's outside financing or something that would help them figure out how to make that jump. That seems to me like something that we might be able to actually work on. But if you get the million dollars from Sanders, that's roughly, if you say 50,000 bucks a hookup, I don't know, ballparking it, that's 20 buildings. That would be significant for Montpelier. Yeah. 
that would be very helpful for buildings that are on the on the system for sure it's buildings that are the pipes run right by it um some of the users some of the bigger users that we we'd really like to get are not on the lines and the uh, the you know the the mains under underground are pretty expensive to put in at least using the the system that was put in place when the system was built um we've started to look at you know different technologies different piping maybe even plastic piping instead of the welded steel piping that type of stuff that, that could give some cost savings on the installations but we're not we're not there with that that homework yet to be honest with you um, you know the real upside of district heat is the the amount of fossil fuel that this thing's capable of offsetting I mean, it's it's so that yeah yeah and it's right it's it's Speak. district heat alone could really get us to net zero and he's under the sidewalk you won't have to buy the melter <laughs> Donna. So I was th looking at our, our TR person here, Evelyn, and thinking maybe you need a cheerleaders squad going with you to visit these things, you know, somehow a big workshop, something to build up some energy and community awareness. And especially if we do have this money that we can offer, uh, it just seems to be hard to do by yourself. That's all. Anybody else? Okay, thanks, Chris. Well, sure. I'll continue you. to be interested in how this goes. And now the uh, next item is the State Street construction presentation, which is going to be long. So our next item is break. And it's right right on time. I, we always shoot for 8.30, and it, it's hard to be closer to 8.30 than we are right now. So 10 minutes. Go in again. Our next item is item number 10 or some other number, uh, East State Street construction presentation. <laughs> and is it a problem with me being, uh, being here? Okay. We all set up? Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Kurt Modica, fellow Kurt. Do you yep. guys in the back want the lights on back there? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm Kurt Modica, public works director. With me tonight is Corey Line, project management director. Um, Corey handles um, the bike and ped program for DPW, uh, as well as uh, transportation related items. Uh, tonight we're going to talk talk about the East State Street reconstruction project. Um, this project's been in development for some time. Um, originally started as a uh, combined sewer overflow elimination project. Um, uh, for those uh, counselors not familiar with that, the um, the sewer system and the storm system in Montpelier were constructed as one um, one combined system initially when it was constructed. Um, over the years, the city has separated m much of the storm out of the sewer lines, but um, there is still several streets, including East State Street, um, where the drainage still goes to the sewer system. And what happens dur is during heavy rains, um, the pipes are not able to, hand to handle all the uh, stormwater and sewage. So there are six remaining points where um, the combined flows over the river. Um, so that's where this project started. From there, it grew to a really full uh, reconstruction to include um, the water utility, the, the sewer main um, storm work. Uh, we also need to do some stormwater treatment, as well as um, really the focus of tonight is uh, the streetscape options. So uh, bike lanes, um, additional sidewalks. Um, a little background on the on the funding. Um, in 2022, um, the city voted a $7.2 million bond for the project. We were able to secure USDA um, loan and grant funding 
Um, USDA provided a um, $3.5 million grant. Uh, we actually funded this project jointly with USDA for both the water resource recovery facility, also known as the wastewater treatment plant, um, as well as the State Street. So this $3.5 million grant is for both of those projects. Um, we only get three and a half million, but we uh, have the ability to split um, where that grant funding goes between the two projects. Uh, we also received um, a state of Vermont ARPA grant for the CSO portion of the project of uh, 1.2 million. And uh, we're doing the uh, design work in-house with DPW staff. Um, and we utilize the, uh, the state revolving loan funds um, Typically, we do this when we hire consultants out, and then and there's subsidies or loan forgiveness um, on the sewer side, the clean water side, of up to fifty percent. So in this case, we're actually the city staff are actually getting um, some money reimbursed back from the state to to conduct this design. Um, and then there's one other potential grant uh, of a pollution control grant of up to two hundred thousand. That's not um, certain yet. They are planning to release um, the state's intended use plan next week. And hopefully we'll learn more on that. It's all based on a point ranking system for all the projects throughout the state of Vermont. So um, if if we get a, a grant amount, we'll, it'll be, depend on where we rank on that scoring system. A little bit about the uh, project sequencing and the schedule. So we've decided uh, that it's really best um, financially and construction wise, uh, schedule wise, to split this into uh, two separate contracts. So two two bid projects. Um, the first project, contract one, is really focused on um, separating the stormwater uh, out of the sewer system. Um, the limits for that project will be from uh, the main and East State intersection out to the Rialto Bridge, where we will construct a new stormwater outfall. Um, most of East State and all of East State Street is actually separated. Uh, in the 90s, the city did a project um, to separate the storm out of the sewer, but um, we're not able to um, uh, complete the separation project uh, at the bottom of the street. So it's all separated until it gets to the Main Street intersection, then it combines back to the sewer system. Um, so that's why the limits would pick up where that uh, separation project ended and continue it out to the river. We're hoping to start construction um, in July and then it would run through uh, right up to winter, um, hopefully November, but you know potentially into December. Uh, the current estimate for that project is $1.2 million, which aligns with the ARPA grant. And um, the the other reason for splitting this out from the larger um, East State Street reconstruction project is that this work will be done through trenchless technologies, which is um, you know not open cut excavation. It would be a drill that runs the new pipe underground. There's a very deep um, proposed installation for the piping. It's approximately 12 feet deep, and that's to get around the existing sewer mains and sewer and the water main in that intersection. It's very congested. Um, so the cost to try to open excavate that traditional excavation would be uh, really high. So it's a specialty type, um, specialty type work to do these these trenchless installations, which is uh, you know the other reason why we wanted to break this up. Um, contract two would be the fully state reconstruction project. So that would be from Main Street all the way up to College Street. We, that would be uh, the following construction year planned to start in May. Um, again, through November, and it would actually be a, a two-year project. So um, we would shut down. We haven't worked out the logistics of um, the sequencing of how that would be phased exactly, but um, we do anticipate that the volume of work would require two, two construction seasons. Uh, the estimated um, baseline cost for that project is 6 to $7.2 million. Um, and this would be constructed through typical techniques of open excavation rather than the trenchless drilling of utility lines. It would also include the um, streetscape work, sidewalks, and, uh, and potential bike lane. I'll turn it over to Corey now. So um, when we look at what East State Street should um, 
what it should look like on the surface, uh, we referenced two different plans, the Montpelier Motion Plan and the uh, Complete Streets Design Report. Um, combine these two city plans, identify which transportation accommodations should be located on any street within the city, given their role uh, within the entire network. Um, and East, uh, according to these two plans, East State Street should uh, have obviously two vehicle lanes, should accommodate parking, sidewalk on both sides, and an uphill bike lane. Um, obviously, for those of you, I'm sure you all know, uh, East State Street is a very steep uh, street. It pushes about 10% grade in some places. Um, the uphill bike lane um, accommodates those uh, uh, traveling uphill who tend to take up more space um, when traveling up steep, steep slopes like that. Um, obviously, it's a very long linear project. Uh, we had to split it up here. So if we could sort of uh, get our bearings, uh, upper left corner, Main Street, as you move right, you're heading up the hill, up to Cedar, up to Hubbard, and then you go to the bottom left, uh, continue to move uphill uh, all the way to the top uh, and at uh, College Street. Um, this is just pointing out the existing sidewalks that are on the street um, in blue here. and. Uh, this would be the, uh, the gaps identified in the master plan um, and some uh, pictures showing those uh, encumbrances or, or steep grades which um, need to be addressed to close those gaps. And those would be done uh, with retaining walls um, to hold back those steep slopes and create the, the necessary room. Um, this is showing the proposed sidewalks with retaining walls, um, and they range roughly from three to six feet. Um, and the other option, is there anything else? Uh, this would show the sidewalk gaps being remediated with the retaining walls, as well as uh, the um, uphill bike lane on the south side of the street. Uh, with this option, all of the parking will be located on the north side of the street. Um, right now, it switches over right about, um, right towards the bottom left of the screen. Um, it switches from the south side or north side over to the south side. Um, this change in parking, it would actually net anywhere from five to 10 spaces on the street total. Um, mostly that's because of the large driveway list section um, between Bingham and uh, um, as you go left there. Um, you'll also notice the, because of the wider envelope of the roadway, the uh, proposed retaining walls increase, uh, which is where you're gonna see your price increase for this, for this build. Did you do? There we go. Um, so this is basically what it would look like. Um, as I said, uh, uh, uphill bike lane, two travel lanes, parking, um, sidewalk on both sides, um, street trees and, and um, decorative lighting would remain on the lower section. Um, And we had a, I thought, a very constructive conversation with the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, um, which Councillor Alfano and Councillor Pate took part in. Um, they were very much in favor of uh, following the city's master plans and uh, going with the uphill bike lane sidewalk, sidewalk gaps uh, remediated. Um, they did make the one recommendation of uh, potential potentially raising that uphill bike lane to the elevation of the sidewalk to create a, a vertical separation between the vehicles and the bicycles. Um, this is, it would be something new for this area, but it, it's a pretty um, standard uh, design element. Uh, bike lanes can be separated either horizontally or vertically. Um, 
it, there'd be so there'd obviously be a learning curve. This is something new for this area. So signage markings, potentially a different material, um, separating the the uh, sidewalk and the the bike lane uh, would be necessary. And you may be thinking, um, I see a spelling error. Uh, uh, you may be thinking, why not just create a shared use path? Well, um, the Agency of Transportation's shared use uh, path design guidelines are uh, pretty specific about not creating those facilities on steep inclines, or if you are increasing around the eight, nine percent slope, um, it's done for a very short distance. And the reason for that is, you could have uh, some very high speed bicycles traveling down and then conflicting with pedestrians if they share that space. Um, so that would be the reason to um, distinctively call out uh, an uphill bike lane next to that walkway and, and try to, uh, best you can, prohibit downhill users in that situation. And so next steps. Um, Impacts to driveways, stairs, walkways, um, get into detail on the retaining walls, uh, reach out to Green Mountain Power. Um, there's going to be some utility pole relocations and make sure those can be accommodated. Um, what impacts might might uh, there be to, to trees? Like we said, I think the um, street trees on the lower <laughs> section are going to be in place unharmed, uh, but up above there may be some some tree impacts and uh, I think Kerr mentioned earlier some stormwater elements to uh, to take into consideration. Cost. Um, so alternative one, we're just keeping, that's the baseline, that's putting back what's there now. A um, couple of travel lanes, parking lane, same sidewalks that are there. Um, the alternative two, just filling in the sidewalk gaps, keeping the two travel lanes with the parking. Um, that is a, an increase of $1.2 million to the project. Adding the uphill bike lane with the sidewalks, that would be an additional of $1.7 million to the project. Um, that, that's $1.7 million onto the original alternative one, onto the baseline. Questions? All right, thank you. Um, to uh, to get oriented a little bit, do we need to make uh, de decisions on what we're going to do with the streetscape tonight, or is this more of a introduction to what we're doing? Uh, ideally, we would get. Um a preferred uh, alternative selection from council tonight so we can advance design. We're hoping to bid out uh, the contract one, you know, in the next month, um, and then immediately move right into design of um, the con second contract. So if possible, that would be great. If that's not, if council is not ready to make that decision, um, we can come back and, and do that another time. Okay, thanks. Lauren, you have your hand up, and Tim, you do too, I think. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I just had two questions. Um, First, so besides just it's nicer to have continuous sidewalks, was there specific safety or concerns with the, you know, having to cross the street? Have issues arisen that make it particularly important to provide the continuous sidewalks? And then my second question is, um, if we expand the sidewalks, is there any kind of like ballpark of increased ongoing, like the maintenance of the retaining walls and the new sidewalks, like something that we should keep in mind of like what that looks like over the longer term in addition to the upfront costs? As far as the, the sidewalk question, um, basically what it does is reduce the number of mid-block crossings. If you look at the layout now, um, especially considering the proximity to the school, if you had someone walking, um, you know, say from the Arsenal neighborhood, Upper College Street, they would have to cross three different times to get to the school. Um, so that's the main idea is to reduce the number of uh, hit walk crossings. 
And then on the maintenance piece, it is um, along the existing, you know, an existing route of our sidewalk plow. So those projects where you extend linearly and, you know, out to like a dead end are, are more increased to operational cost. There will be some, you know, additional salt and, and staff time, but I, you know, I wouldn't anticipate that to be significant, you know, under, you know, less than 5,000 for sure. Um, yeah, so the question about the retaining walls and the ongoing. Sorry, retaining walls and ongoing maintenance of them. And I think our history is with clay soils and Boy Montpelier is we've got a, a lot of them already, especially that one above Hubbard Street on the right when you're looking at Tim. I think you're not being heard. I'm not being heard. Does this help? It's also across the room because I don't get the mic in. Does this help? Okay. It's reverb. So anyway, that the concern is the retaining walls. Um, and the other piece would be um, at, you know, 100 East State Street, that section up to Bingham, where you've got the, the big bank that you're going to cut into and do a retaining wall. That bank is just clay. I know when my parents bought that house, um, it took over 10 years for the city to stabilize that bank and stop it from flowing into East State Street. It was pretty dubious. Um, having lived through that, I would not encourage touching that thing again if you don't have to. Um, it was really bad. Yeah, or I didn't address the retaining wall piece. I mean, it would all, and, and the... Um... The sidewalk itself, I mean, replacement. These are these would be added assets for the city to maintain. Mm -hmm. So you would have, you know, the replacement cost that one point two, one point seven, you know, escalated. You know, you should get um, twenty to fifty years at least out of a retaining wall. But you know, at some point they're going to have to be replaced. And you're right. You know that, um, you know, Tom McArdle, former director Tom McArdle, has warned us about um, that bank uh, where, where your uh, where your property was. Um, my understanding is there's some large boulders sort of placed in there to support that. And um, yeah, we'd, we'd likely anticipating some temporary sheeting in order to make that, um, you know, construct that retaining wall. You know, once it's in place, properly designed, you know, it should, it should hold and last, um, but eventually you will have to replace those assets. So that is something to keep in mind. Anybody on the side? Donna. Uh, Corey, would you go back to the slide that has the amounts for all the three different choices? Okay, one, what's your financial? What's our financial uh, limits? What do we now have in place? All right. So we have the seven point two million dollar bond. The project was um, bonded based on putting back the existing sidewalk limits. Um, we uh, but we do have the additional one point two million in the ARPA grant. So that's on top of the $7.2 million bond. And then, as I mentioned, we also have a $3.5 million USDA grant. But, um, you know, presumably some of that 3.5 would also would uh, go to the wastewater plant project. So, um, so at most, you know, you have 4.7 um, of grant money. Um, but some of that should be should really will need to go to uh, the wastewater plant project. So I was trying to put those numbers with that. So what? It seems like we have the 7.2 and the 1.2, but we don't have the 1.7. Well, like I said, the USDA grant um, could could cover that 1.7. Right. But if we make decisions to use it there, then you can't use it somewhere else. Right. That's right. Or, I mean, the other thing to keep in mind is if you, if you, um, you know, don't do the extra scope, that's less debt service on the overall project. So, um, you know, the grant money would go to the existing project, reducing how much the city has to borrow on that bond. Hmm. Okay. And, and just the, and then the other piece of which we talked about, with, you know, that wonderful slide you had with the sidewalks. I'm just wondering if, it, yes, okay. So up by uh, the side of the street, the, the upper side, the Bingham, Bingham side, if we didn't do that side and only put the additional sidewalk on the right side of the road with a uphill bike lane, is that any significant difference in cost? It's one less retaining wall. Yeah, yeah we don't have that breakdown, but it would be, you know, several hundred thousand dollars, probably, 
you know, I don't know, I would guess somewhere between three and 500,000 less. Something like that. It's a pretty uh, significant wall in that area. Um, I'd like to do them all. I'm just trying to figure out how to afford it. Well, we do. Yeah, we do have, there is enough grant money to make up the difference um, between the USDA grant and the ARPA grant um, without having to go back and rebond and still have sufficient funds to complete the wastewater project. Yeah, we have to put it out to bid. And we don't know those That's numbers true. are in a hole. That's true. If we get, um, if the bids come in really high, then, um, you know, that would definitely have to be reconsidered. You're right. And and the infrastructure committee left Corey with the, if we have to cut back, we really wanted at least one side to go all the way up as a shared use. Uh, so you know, if bids became high, I think we have to talk about what's our fallback. While we're talking about the dollars, um, I, I thought I understood this this afternoon from the emails, and now maybe I don't understand it again. We have three different figures, 7.2 million for the base plan, 1.2 million to add the uh, sidewalks, and then 1.7 million. And that 1.7, is or is not on top of the 1.2? It's it's not on top of the 1. Point. It's on top of the um, 7.2 million. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I had a bunch of questions about the CSO. Um, it, it seems like we're we're we've gotten ahead of uh, our target on uh, eliminating CSO uh, sites. Is that right? And which is good, obviously. Yeah. Um, well, no, I think we're, so the city has what's called a long-term control plan. It's a state reviewed and approved, and it sort of is the map to the projects we have to do in order to um, be in compliance with our discharge permit. Um, you know, I think uh, State Street was actually um, planned to be last year, and we're doing that this year. That's another CSO project right in front of the Capitol. And um, and I believe this project is uh, was slated for this year, so that's on, on track. Mm -hmm. Great. And this, and so then after this is done, there'll be five remaining sites left or, or four because this, because the state street is also going this year. Uh, there's, there'll be still six um, uh, remaining structures that can overflow. And really we need to wait and see what the impacts are from these separation projects before we know if we're able to abandon those. Um, the next projects will be increasing the capacity in the in the trunk line along the bike path to make sure we get as much um, much of the flows to the plant as we can. Um, have we ever done the uh, trenchless uh, a trenchless project in Montpelier before? Yeah, uh, yes, we have. We've done several. Yeah, cool, and it works fine. Not, we shouldn't be worried about embarking on that. Uh, um, well, we think it's the best approach. There's always risk in any project, but um, we do think it's, it's it's definitely the best approach for this particular scenario. And this CSO work is going to address the uh, the issue of the odor at the bottom of East State Street, right? Um, we haven't worked out the details if the those exact catch basins, there's two right at the bottom that would be um, resolved on under this project. But certainly after the second contract, it definitely would be, yes. Great. Any other questions over here? Uh, I just wanted to clarify that the you said the 1.2 million ARPA grant was for the CSO on State Street, not East State Street. Is that right? So th those funds wouldn't be applied to produce the 7.2. Is that correct? Um, no, that is for this this project, the East State Street project, that 1.2 million. Okay, so we okay. also got a separate ARPA grant for State Street and um, 675,000. Okay. Um, any other questions? Just yeah, it's Carrie, uh, or just thoughts on uh, on the whole system, the whole idea. Just one other thing, Jack. Sure. Um, I noticed the sidewalk on the north side, opposite West Street in the green, is right up again, right up against all those houses. I assume we have the right of way to all of that, and um, there, there'll be some some program to um, acclimate 
the homeowners to the project, shall we say? Um, yeah, so the right of way um, back in the day, East State Street was originally laid out to basically be an extension of the class one State Street. So we actually have a lot more right of way than what you would typically East have on a class radius. three road. Yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, in that area, I, I believe the right of way goes right up to the houses. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so once we know the, the. Do the homeowners know that, do you think? Or... Uh, <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> well, I don't know when the last time that, that house was turned over. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you, though, it was just subdivided probably four or five years ago. Yeah. Uh, and the boundary survey used showed the right of way right up to the right up to the house. So, uh, you know, I don't know if the current, but anyways, uh, once we get to the, uh, we get into the details of the actual impacts, um, yes, there'll be, uh, yeah. you know, there'll be an outreach to the uh, impacted properties. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for this detailed breakdown and all the maps and everything. Um, I My big concern about the site, just as a user, um, a pedestrian and a driver about the sidewalks on East State Street is the crossing problem. Um, I think that sidewalks on both sides of the street are always great. You know, if we could have that, that's great. But um, I'm interested in Donna's idea if it's possible to just forego that section by Bingham Street and just keep the one sidewalk running all the way on the other side of the street, running straight through. And if that would be a significant enough savings that, you know, we would actually notice that in the in the bottom line, I would like to know about that. Um, I, I'm not interested in just reproducing what's currently there. I think we need to fill in the sidewalk gaps in some way. I think the, as long as we're doing this construction, the idea of the bike lane, Sounds great. We won't have more people using bikes if we don't build the infrastructure for it. So um, it seems like an opportunity to do that. But I am also interested in if there's ways we can shave a little off here and there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if could we could we put that retaining? I mean, I I hadn't heard Tim's story about the mud <laughs> till tonight, and. Um, I'm a little worried about it, and I'll bet our bidders are going to be worried about it too. I wonder if there's a way to put that into the uh, contract request as an alternate, so that they can break out the cost of that. Because I'll bet there's going to be a lot of contingency money for that retaining wall. Because Tim's not the only one who knows that mud story in the among the people who are going to be bidding on this project. That's my guess. Um. We certainly could bid it as an alternate. The only risk to doing that is that sometimes contractors will, you know, inflate the cost on the alternate work. Um, so you would end up potentially paying more if you did select that alternate, potentially. That's the only risk to doing it, but we certainly could bid it that way if that's the council's. Um, a lot of times what we'll do is, um, you know, negotiate if, if say, the prices came in um, higher than uh, the city could support. We can reduce scope items out of the contract as well. Um, so we um, got to uh, Grout Road to kind of get closer to budget. Um, so there are some options there, um, but I think the best approach would be to kind of um, bid what we really intend to build if we can, um, and then make a decision from there based on what the bids come in at. Um. So if I made a motion for the 7.2 and the 1.7, that covers the bike lane, sidewalks, and the retaining walls. Yes, based on current estimates. And then if the numbers come in higher, then we may have to do some adjustments. Yeah, that's right. Is that right? Yes. That's my motion. I would like to make the motion that we do, we authorize the 1.2 million it's not so much seven. that it's what's the, no, you're, the whole the whole package is the what whole you're package. Moving. option yeah. c oh right. c okay yeah. i don't have it up here three sorry either there, i mean there's also the the possibility um prior to getting construction prices for the project there may be some unforeseen circumstances that we run into during design mm -hmm. which then the accommodations become just you know the, the cost of the accommodations become disproportionate to the to the purpose. So right, and um, we revisit it. Right. 
So yes. it, it, you may, you know, it may not have to go to bid to be able to realize, you know, this is kind of okay. getting out. I guess I'd like to start with the, the yep. right intention. Yep. We did the Montpelier motion. We've done the complete streets. Let's let's do it. So there's a motion. There's not a second yet. Second. Okay. Anyone else have any? Tim, look like you're about to. As the motion stands, I'll vote no because I really I do like the idea of the contiguous sidewalk up one side, which would include the bike lane, and I really can't support those sidewalks filling in on the left side on the north side, knowing what I know. Lauren. Yeah, um, I second it, and I'm going to support this motion. I just echo the sentiment of people that I think that priority of having one side continuous um, and ideally it being side where we could do the uphill bike lane seems like a high priority. And then if we learn that, you know, there's the ability to do the retaining wall, stay within this budget and all that, then I think being able to do both sides seems great to me, but I just echo the priority of really getting that one continuous um, if that's what's gonna take to stay within budget. Anybody else? Boy, this is, um... As soon as I saw this, I thought it would be great to eliminate the uh, the crossing. You know, there are so, so many places people have to cross. And I know, and we all know, people do not just cross at crosswalks. And, and, that, and that just makes it that much more hazardous. Yeah. So I, I would love to see us be able to do sidewalks on both sides if that's a feasible option. Any other discussion? Yes, Sal. Well, I I don't I don't have enough confidence in this um, this hill of the clay. Uh, I mean, it just sounds like a um, you know an albatross that that's going to be around everybody's neck. Um, right, you know, right from the start. I mean, I. I'm, I'm, I like the idea. I, I walk that route a lot, and I hate having to cross the street twice, you know, to get where I'm going. Um, so a continuous sidewalk with a bike lane all the way up on the south side appeals to me. Um, and I just as soon avoid the headache of the retaining wall, frankly. Um, So I, I don't know if we can, unless we can break out the cost of that. I, I mean, we we could certainly use the, the money somewhere else. So uh, I I prefer to to see a, a scale back version. Okay. Any other discussion? Are we ready to vote? Can I throw on some more confusion? Jeff? Yeah. <laughs> always, we're always open for more confusion. Um, and again, we haven't looked into specifically that option of just the one site, but we could run into a situation where the total, um, you know, the, the total envelope of the street, even without the north sidewalk around Bingham Street, the need for a retaining wall in order to increase the width of the road in order to accommodate the bike lane. Um, again, we haven't dug into that kind of detail, but that could end up very well being the case. So we, we, you may not, if you want the bike lane, you may not be able to uh, get away from the retaining walls. Mm -hmm. uh, that we would get into that if, if, if we're looking at the full build out, build out, we would obviously get into that with design, with further design. If we're looking at this entire full build, mm -hmm. I like that point because we would get into more information as we go, and so if the goal is to go and try. We'll find out whether it's feasible or not. And that's what I would prefer. And what do you expect the timeline would be to have done the design work and be able to come up back and tell us we can do this thing, we can't do that thing without going over what we thought we were going to spend? Um, our best estimate would be early next winter. We'd have enough data, you know, there'd be some additional soil borings that we're going to need to look at the clay soils and stability of them. Um, and you know, it's construction season. So 
our staff is um, somewhat limited on how much time we can spend on design right now. So yeah, I would say probably um, sometime in January. Okay, thanks. We also, um, in our conversation with the Transportation uh, Infrastructure Committee, said to them, you know, we would give them periodic updates. If we start running into problems, they would be updated uh, as well. Mm -hmm. right. As well as the council. As well updated, as the council. Course, they would yeah. probably get more frequent updates as far as minor things that might come up uh, so that they can prepare any recommendations for you. Yep. So, so it sounds like we'll have another opportunity to review the final design prior to it's going to bid. Yeah. So that's yeah. what you're saying. And that would be um, when sometime next summer. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, are we, Lauren? And just so I'm understanding right, are you anticipating that even if we vote this down and did a revised version that Jess was looking at bike lane on one side, you're going to have to do the same coring and stuff potentially to assess retaining wall? Like, are we saving? Would you do a different analysis um, that would somehow save the city? time and money if we right now decided to do the slightly paired back version or is it going to essentially be the same analysis so by authorizing the full thing now tentatively we're we'll get the full picture yeah there will be additional you know subcontractor costs and a fair amount of additional staff time to look and evaluate these um, retaining wall areas so it would you know that's kind of what we're looking for is a, a directive on, on the design uh, interests by the council um so if if there's not interest in um you know expending the extra money on the additional retaining walls up on one side on the north side um you know it'd be helpful to know that now it would save us some you know some effort on on the design work and and cost for you know some subcontractors to do boring work and, and things like that can i ask another confusing question um <laughs> so can we can we take the, you were talking about dimension, the dimensions may not allow, or the existing width of the road may not allow for a sidewalk and a bike lane on the south side at this 100 State Street hill of clay and the roadway with parking and sidewalks without, or, and no sidewalk, just parking without a retaining wall. That you're saying you may you may discover that. Yeah, it's possible to Should accommodate uh, to accommodate the uh, the bike lane on the south side. Yeah. So can to, you discover that one. before you spend uh, any any money uh, trying to figure out what you need to build a retaining wall on that hill? Yeah, the alignment of where everything would line up would be the next step, and then we would. And understand kind of, the full kind of up against that yep. big retaining wall that exists already on the south side kind of, kind of right yeah there might be some room for some um some horizontal curvature within the road to be able to yeah. um you know maybe avoid those retaining walls um if we were just if we were putting the sidewalk there so we may find that out early enough right. to save the ex exploration costs yep. yeah okay I am confused now. Are we? What are we voting for? The motion is to approve the going forward with design work for all of the options. Sidewalk, uh, the basic project, sidewalk on both sides, and the uh, bike path. Okay, so we are not voting any of the alternatives. We are saying that they should go and work all of them. Right. Alternative okay. three is what is what that is. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's on the slide we have in front of us right now. Are we? Yes, Carrie. So I'm, I'm going to vote for this, um, but I, I I think you've probably heard that um, it would be great if you could explore the idea of scaling back a little bit. Um, but I want you to have the option since you didn't present that as an alternative and it wasn't something that you prepared. Um, I don't want us to, I wouldn't be comfortable directing you to do that right now, but um, so I'll vote yes on this. So you have kind of that full option, but knowing that um, we're going to revisit this and that 
there's a strong interest expressed on the council for possibly a scaled back version without that retaining wall and um, extra sidewalk. Or maybe that's just me. That's just me. I can speak for myself. I was just asking <laughs> the same thing. So thank you. Yeah. All right. Are we ready to vote? If so, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. So is that, and all those opposed? No. No. Ayes have it. It's, it's, we got four, right? Okay. Okay. Don't move. Because <laughs> you're still on deck. Yeah, this one's. I can hang out. Here we go. All right, my name is Zach Podgett, and I'm here tonight to talk about our payment management program. Um, I called this, uh, this presentation Building a Better Network. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about uh, an overall background of the program, our management strategies, and I will give you a high-level overview of our network, and then we will briefly talk about uh, the next steps. So first, we'll start off with some definitions. Um, PCI. Uh, also known as payment condition index. It's a numerical rating from zero to 100 that represents the overall condition of your, your payment. It's based on the different types of distresses uh, that are observed when an inspection is completed. Uh, your class one town highways. Taking up the words. What about the top? Do you need that gone too? Or? That good? Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, so our class one town highways uh, are those that are extension of the state highway system. Uh, they generally carry a, a route uh, number that is associated with them, such as route two or route two, uh, 302. Your class two town highways are like your East State Street, your Town Hill Roads. Uh, they generally connect um, from community to community and they have a high volume of traffic, but not as much as your class ones. And your class threes are um, the ones that are not designated as your ones or twos and um, are generally um, have a lower uh, volume of traffic and uh, are at all points in time during the year can be um, accessed by a, a standard vehicle. Here's a breakdown of our different classifications uh, and the mileage that's associated with them. So our class ones are roughly 10 and a half miles. Our class two is eight. Our class threes are uh, 33 miles. Our class fours are 0.8 and uh, the other associated roads are 3.6. Um, so that you all are aware, uh, city funds go towards class twos, threes, and fours. Class ones are the responsibility of the state of Vermont for maintenance and repaving. Uh, sorry, for, for pay, repaving. Uh, DPW still performs the maintenance such as snow clearing, um, or if we do pothole patching, that is our responsibility on, our, on a class one highway. Uh, next, I've prepared this video that just has a, a, an overview of pavement management strategies that I would like to play for you all. You know why I don't have audio? Where? Oh. 
What was that? You might have to choose a share audio option on Zoom somewhere just to share your screen. Yeah. Share sound. I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> Thank you, because I'm not sure we would have got there. No. <laughs> Is it not working because we all have our speakers turning off? Let's see. Well, would you like me to provide a general commentary of what they are talking about? And we'll just start from the beginning and I'll do my best. And then uh, we can go back. I can send you guys the link because I think it's a really important video um, when you're starting to talk about payment management. So here they're talking about roads and um, that over the lifespan of a road, you'll see that you have different uh, distresses that come up um, over the lifespan of a road. Um, over time, uh, people that are making decisions should understand that when you get into a full reconstruction project, that is very costly. So in order to uh, in better leverage your network, it's better to preserve your roads that are in good conditions to avoid the really costly repairs that are avoid unavoidable if you need to do the full reconstructions and pay the maximum cost per dollar. Here is a, a graph that shows the deterioration over the lifespan of the roads. And as you see, the road is cracking. Um, so in order to make informed decisions, and we should, we invest in the asset um, initially and the upfront cost. And instead of having to every, you know, so a road will deteriorate and we would have to pay the maximum cost every 10 or 15 years. If we maintain those roads, we can, we leverage, our, our dollars are leveraged better. Um, in a nutshell, that's kind of what that video was supposed to do. It was much better done than I just did it. Um, and it just goes on to talk about that there's significant environmental savings by reusing products, um, whether that's through cold planing or uh, cold in place recycling. Um, so there's a lot of potential um, in the future if, when you're doing preservation techniques. So I will send this link around so that everybody can look at it on their own time. Okay, so next I'm gonna talk about the different treatments op options and their applicable uses. So first of all is a crack seal. Um, for those that don't know what a crack seal is, it's an- it's hey, an Zach? Yeah. Just the, it looks like the online version hasn't caught up with a, I don't know if there's something with a sharing. How's that? Yeah. Really catch up now? Okay. Uh, so crack sealing is a process of where you place an, ad an adhesive sealant over a crack and it prevents water from getting into the road base. Uh, your fog sealing, which is something that was new this past year was the first time that Montpelier has ever done a fog sealing project. Um, it's a, a asphaltic spray that gets applied to over the whole road surface. And there's really two main things that it does. It keeps the stones at the top of the surface so that the plows, as they go over it, they're not wearing the top surface off. And then it, it, it also allows to give that the flexibility back in your roadway. So over time, the liquids get burned out and the road becomes more brittle. And so when it, when, that, when it starts to get brittle, it allows for more cracks, and then the water gets into the cracks, gets underneath the road, and then you start to see this advanced um, cycle of deterioration. An overlay is when you place a thin layer of pavement over an existing surface. Your mills and fills are when you shave off the top layer of pavement, and then you, it's usually done with either one or two courses of an overlay. So you take off an inch or two, and then you put back an inch or two of pavement. Uh, a cold in place recycle is what we did last year on Main Street, where they set up a milling machine, and the milling is in front uh, of the paver. All of the material gets recycled 
that all of the material that was on the road gets recycled back into the process. So typically when we do a mill and fill pro project, all of those millings have to then be transported and stored somewhere, and then they get recycled at a, a pavement plant. Last year, when we did the cold in place recycling, all of that material was reused and repurposed on site. And that's where those eco um, savings come in. Um, there's not any truck that, trucks that are hauling all that material off site. It's all reused. And then a cold in place recycling project, um, there's actually two more components. After that surface is recycled, it's then sprayed with a, a sealant in order to kind of lock everything in. And then it's overlaid with uh, a, a, an overlay course of asphalt. A reclamation is a process of, um, it's basically a, a rototiller uh, for people that are, are gardeners. Um, you take the existing asphalt, you till it, and you create a new sub-base material. You add chemicals to strengthen it and to make it tight again. And then that surface is then overlaid with two lifts, generally depending on um, the road design, anywhere from uh, two to one and a half inches. Um, you, we generally are applying about a three and a half to four inch, um, four inches of new asphalt on top of a reclaimed street. And then your reconstructions are your most costly uh, treatments. And that's when you have a roadway that's in an extremely poor condition um, and you're rebuilding the whole sub base, you're digging it down. And those projects are generally, we try to align those with um, utility work that is occurring. So East State Street is an example of a reconstruction project. We're gonna do water, sewer, stormwater, bike lanes, and all of that, the road uh, would be reconstructed and stabilized with geogrid and then paved. Here are some typical price ranges for the various treatments that we just, discuss, just discussed. Um, so everything is represented in square yards. So that's length of the street times the width and then converted into a square yard uh, formula. So, or square yard unit price. So your crack ceiling is you know anywhere from 50, 50 cents to 75 cents. Your fog ceiling is $1.25 to uh, $1.75. Your overlays are nine to 12. Your mill and fills are 17 to 23. Your cold in place recycling is 25 to 35. Your reconstruction only. Um, the reason why I put this in there is because it's applicable for what we actually do. So there's some streets that we don't get into like having to put in the geogrid and it's a like a we kind of meet them in the middle. Um, so we use DPW crews to remove that asphalt and then to uh, dress it up with a little bit of new material and then pave it only. So it's kind of like a, it's not a full reconstruction. It's only like a, a partial reconstruction. Um, your reclaims are again, uh, when you're rototilling the roadway and they they run from 35 to $40 per square yard. And your full reconstructions are anywhere from 50 to $75 a square yard. And these are prices, price ranges that we've, that Montpelier has specifically experienced over the years of managing the, the pavement network. Here's a, a graphical image that I like to show because it shows all of the different, um, you know, severities of your road. So on your A represents a, a newly paved street where it's in good condition. And then as you move towards the F, you're into your, your failed or your uh, very serious, uh, poor, really poor condition streets. Um, what that translate into to treatments, right? So you're between your A and your Bs, those are your fog ceiling, your crack ceiling, those are really good times to do those treatments. When you get towards a B to a C, you're more moving from that satisfactory to fair level, and you're looking at you know, milling off the top surface. You could potentially do an overlay if the, if the street is still in a good enough condition. Uh, then when you move into your, between C and D, you're more likely to be into your cold in place recycling, your reclamation, or potentially your your reconstructs. Um, and then once you get to an F, um, you're, you're at pretty much the highest cost per dollar for the roadway, which is one of the, it's a really big reason why roads that are in the worst condition 
really stay there because economically you don't ever you're never able to get ahead if you only were to ever address the very worst street first you can't get ahead with your with leveraging your dollars so moving forward um it's best to have a network a total network improvement approach so I'm gonna read this uh, little excerpt because I, I really like uh, what it represents. Amazing things happen when a road network is viewed holistically rather than a series of one-offs. More durable roads, lower expenses, higher degrees of sustainability, better driver safety, et cetera. It's a matter of just making sound decisions guided by an aligned approach and they can be achieved in three steps that happen in a cycle. First, you assess your payment condition. For those of, that, for those of, that, of you who don't know, um, our, the, what we do with our PCI is we conduct a, a manual inspection every three years. So the first one that I did was com completed in 2015, and then again in 18, and then in 2021. With that data, you then optimize your treatment plan, and then you have to measure your progress, which is best done annually if, if you can. Um, the hard thing is that when you were only doing a, a, a re- uh, an inspection every three years to measure that progress and to report back on what the actual PCI is. It's kind of a moving target, right? You're you're reporting back and you haven't done an inspection, so you, it's you're you're extrapolating the deterioration and providing what the improvement was. Ideally, you'd be doing an inspection every year. Um, the inspection takes about three weeks of staff time and two people plus an uh, analysis time. So. That three weeks is sending people around and they go around to every road, they measure the width, they measure with the tape, they measure all the distresses, they calculate what they are, and then they plug that into the computer system and then that calculates a PCI for them. Okay, so the next three slides, I'm going to walk you through, this is a tool um, that I use when looking at different um, roads and different scenarios. So. This tool, you what you do is you plug in the upper left your network miles. Um, you apply your average width to your roadway, and then in this scenario, I pr I plugged in the budget that we used last year. That was actual dollars that were that were allocated towards pavement management last year. What you'll see is that you didn't spend any money in this scenario. This isn't what we actually did last year. This is a hypothetical scenario if we only spent all of the same money that we had towards a worse first scenario. So you'll see zero dollars were used towards preservation, zero towards rehabilitation, and all that money was going towards reconstruction. You were able to resurface one lane mile that basically credited you 34 miles worth of lane mile years. Um, and you can see that you're only per, um, addressing 3% of your road network, and you've actually lost um, eight years and uh, lane mile years of life for the road. This next option is a, is a conventional approach. Given the same budget, same network miles, same width, you'll see that your reconstruction is down to zero. You were able to address 7% of your road network, but you actually have a, um, your net loss in lane mile years was is actually greater than it was on the previous slide. And this balance, balance network approach is what we actually did last year. We were able to address 16% of our roads. We gained four lane mile years to our network and we broke, we were had a wide range of all of the techniques. We did cold in place recycling, we did milling, we did full depth reclamation, and we did uh, fog seal and crack seal. Um, so this is where we need to be. We need to have a, a balanced approach um, in order to really leverage our dollars in the, in the best way possible moving forward in the future. Uh, this is a summary by treatment type. Uh, so you can see the money that we spent on the various treatments and what that totaled out for last year. So we, we spent 56,000 in fog and crack sealing. Our milling and filling projects were uh, 250,000, our cold in place recycling 510, and our reclaims were 225.
So what does this mean for the future um, paving funding needs for us? Um, we are looking uh, at about anywhere between 875000 to a million dollars in need annually. Um, this year, we have put forward 118000 towards paving. Um, they, we have a lot of competing needs. Capital plan has a lot of different things that are competing for the same amount of funds. Uh, so we always do our best to leverage what we have, but ideally we would be at a target of more than 875,000 and closer to the million dollars moving forward. This graph shows you, um, applies a 2% escalation um, after year FY25. One this year. Yeah, I'm getting that. Okay. <laughs> Here is the breakdown uh, that aligns with the funding for what I just showed you um, and how we would intend to use that money. Um, if there was more money in the capital plan, things which it would be each one of these years would be more of a, a balanced approach that I was just talking about. We would have a little bit more reconstructs, a little bit more mills, more preservation it would look a little bit differently. These are the priorities that are for Public Works, but um, it's not nearly so black and white as just saying, well, we don't do this street. This year, we're gonna do it next year. We are trying to align with other utility needs. We're trying to align with sidewalk stuff that needs to be improved and stormwater and water and sewer. So it's not nearly as one dimensional as just saying, yep, we're gonna pave this street and it's the next one that's up. So our summary and next steps in the last few years, really since really COVID hit, um, we've seen drastic increases in, in costs around 15 to 20%. Um, we need to continue to strive for a balanced network approach, uh, utilizing all treatments, but the right treatment at the right time for the roadway. These major projects like East State Street are very costly. Um, so preserving our assets is uh, it's very advantageous for us. And then, like I just said in the previous slide, we have a ton of competing demands, uh, whether it's equipment or buildings or energy. Uh, there's a lot of uh, places that are pulling the same pool of money. Um, so that's just something that we need to consider moving forward. Um, the last four things that I'm gonna talk about are kind of, uh, they're key things that are happening right now uh, that are, beneficial and play a role in, in all of this. The main one is that this year, uh, Route 2 and Route 302, that's a state paving project where they're going to improve about 10% of our entire road network. Um, it's one of the reasons why the funding in this year was a little bit lower. We're doing a lot of other really big projects that require quite a bit of staff time, um, but also because the state is going to be taking 10% of our road network and making it uh, to a, a hundred condition index again, um, which will, for a lot of, I mean, our biggest complaints are along Memorial Drive. Uh, I mean, that's where we're getting tons of uh, complaints about mufflers, pop tires, um, you know, just the overall road condition. Um, the other thing that I'm extremely excited about is, um, with the help of the planning department, we received a municipal planning grant this year and that is to conduct a LIDAR inspection. And so this will be the first time that we're using LIDAR to analyze our road network, um, which will provide us with a lot more data than having a, a person go out and having to physically measure all of these things. That, and it takes around three weeks. With this, um, with this type of technology, they will drive the road, we will get a report back, we will have the ability to put that on uh, an online data portal so that people can see, they can pull up the pictures, they can see the distresses. It also allows us to have a more strategic approach in the like the stop gap measures, which are the interim measures for um, like wheel rutting. So you can, you can understand that, well, maybe the roadway is in pretty decent condition and we should be uh, only doing, you know, a three foot, uh, pavement patch along, you know, the area where there's a rut. Um, so you will be able to take that data and make more informed decisions moving forward. Um, some of the other things that we just need to consider is trying to, if it, conti it continues to be a 
a council priority to achieve a 70 PCI, then we will need to increase the funding to align with that in order to be able to achieve that goal. And then the other thing is we need to annually measure the progress in which we're doing. Um, and I would recommend considering either doing annual or biannual LIDAR inspections and getting out of the manual um, inspections moving forward. I think that will provide better data. Um, we will be able to use that uh, to leverage and make better decisions about how to maintain our road network um, in a more efficient manner moving forward. So with that, are there any questions? <laughs> I'm sure there are a lot of questions. A real um, short one. Sorry, I thought you were looking at me. Maybe you weren't. I thought you were raising your hand. Yeah, so yeah. I said, I said you weren't. Oh, there's a LIDAR inspection tank. I and don't know. I mean, I they, they drive the road at a fairly quick pace. So I would think that it's a, like a day. And so you've got a grant. And is that doing all the roads? All yeah, it'll do all 50 miles of roads. The, when we wrote the, so times have changed a little bit. When we wrote the grant, the estimates that were given for the grant, um, we thought we would only be able to do roads. And we, there was a little bit of extra money there. So we decided that we were going to look at tree assessments as well. Um, and now uh, the technology is moving quickly. And when I talked to a, a, a vendor recently, um, it looks like we might be able to get sidewalk assessments, trees, and uh, roadway condition as part of the whole package and signage. It's like an a la carte uh, option that you can get. Um, they would drive the road, they take all of the points at the same time, and then they take it back to the office, they analyze it, and then they package it up for you. Um, it would be, it's extremely beneficial for us. It's something that we need uh, to do. We need to be able to understand all of our assets and the conditions and where they are and what, um, you know, how to manage all of them together. Great, great. Thanks for getting mm -hmm. that, great. Um, so, a couple of thoughts that I have. I, I think this is great information. I think it uh, it's it's maybe counterintuitive, but that's probably good, you know, to shake us out of what we think that may not be right. But uh, a couple of thoughts I have are one, uh, the role that the uh, the size of the road or the number of people in the road uh, have has on. Uh, decisions of uh, maintenance and, and replacement. And uh, I, maybe this is related. You know, we, I think probably every one of us hears from somebody in their district that says, my street is the worst street in the, uh, in the city and it's terrible and I broke my axle or whatever. And is, does this, approach that you're uh, talking about using mean that we're some of those worst streets just never <laughs> never get fixed yeah obviously i can see if you're doing the worst first problem means that you're always only doing the worst street because you you take the worst street the next year some other street is the worst street you do that You'd never have good streets, or everything is just constantly going downhill. But does does this run the risk of like saying, well, if you're on the worst street, you know that's just the way it's going to be. So, a lot of successful programs transition to setting goals, right? So, like if they have fifteen, just say fifteen percent of their streets are in the very serious or poor category, right? their targets are to improve annually improve that number. So, right. So like this year might be 15, but in the next five years, when we, when we look back, maybe we're now at 10. So that number is always constantly moving down, which is why it's really important to measure your progress to see how effective your, your plan is actually working. Um, so that's one thing that I would suggest is um, developing some kind of guidelines and targets about, what you would actually like to achieve because just achieving a 70 pci it, it's good um and it can be done but it can also that doesn't mean that you're going to have happy constituents either at the end of that i mean you can get there and get a 70 pci and have a section of your roads that are all zero right um 
So I think you need to have a balanced approach. Um, I can provide, this was meant to be a really high level overview presentation. I can get more into the weeds about where we're at, how many sections of roads are in a current condition. My recommendation though would be to wait until the LIDAR inspection is done and then analyze that data and say, okay, today we have this many segments of roadway that are in these category groupings and then make some strategic um, goals that would align with what you would like to see, right? And what you see kind of um, everywhere else that is kind of is moving towards, the, towards this is they just make a target, right? That they want to have, they want to achieve a 70 PCI. Maybe that's one of their goals. Uh, they want to reduce their number of roads that are in a very serious or poor condition. Maybe that's another one of their goals. Um, and then maybe a long-term goal would be to let nothing drop below a you know a 50 PCI. Once you can start, once you get there and get everything in a better condition, you keep them, um, you know, on the the highest level. Some of the most successful programs are putting all of their money towards preservation. They've gotten their roads in good condition, and they spend they are able to actually resurface or preserve like 70 to 80 percent of their their network every single year um, we're a little ways away from that so. it, 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 is the lidar grant i i must have missed this is the lidar grant a grant for them to come in and do the inspection or is does it give us the lidar machine so we can do it wherever we want to? so the company can actually give us the equipment to do it. I don't recommend that. I mean, we're just barely getting into the LIDAR. I would, I mean, given that it's also a grant fund, I would much rather pay for someone to come in, drive them, get, they are doing this day in and day out, give us the analytics on that. Um, and it's, it's a pretty affordable program. Um, it, it wasn't this way three or five years ago. It was when it was kind of on the cutting edge it was way more expensive and we weren't really looking at it because the cost was so, you when you're looking at like a $20,000 annual cost just to get, just to drive the streets. And now it's much more cost effective. Um, so I would recommend having a consultant do the, the analytics. We could do it, um, but especially not in year one, I would think, let's see how it works. Let's understand it. And then moving forward, if it's something that we think would be beneficial, great if not we but we have enough work so uh, <laughs> i'm not thinking that would be yeah. a, a great you, use you guys are doing other things too mm -hmm. apparently thank you for the presentation uh are there any grants for the burst streets repairment uh, uh um yeah so there are grants um but like for the state of Vermont, the grants are all class two town highway grants, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't, the way that they fund grants is not, they don't actually look at the road condition. They look at the community, the last time that they received funding and the overall applicant pool. Mm -hmm. So they're not, they're not factoring in how they award the money based on the overall condition. Mm -hmm. And that's the only paving grant that I know of is the class two town mm -hmm. highway grant um, that is offered for the states. Mm -hmm. So, and that would be like your town hill road, your main street. Um, yeah, so, but as a city, we have to fix all the roads, right? And as the capital of state, yep. having a very bad condition on our streets, it's not good. And, um, I have been um, emailed and also sell too about the North Street. And I walked there, but today for the first time, I drove all the way up. Driving, it's really, really bad. Yeah. And that street, I bet other streets are like that. Uh, as Jack, um, as the mayor mentioned, um, most of the people are saying same thing, right? But North Street, According to this plan, they will not get any kind of work. I don't know what, like six years, seven years, because uh, as far as I understood, you have to redo the street, not only paving or just uh, constructing, but you have to 
redo it again because it's so bad. So yeah, yeah so what's the plan? <laughs> North Street is one, and a lot of these streets are kind of, they fall into the same category, just like East State Street. The road is in very poor condition, and they also have other assets that are in dire need of repair as well. North Street needs a new water main, it needs sewer work, and it needs the road to be fully rebuilt. And that's why you don't just pave over the road today is to make kind of the complaint go away because, you know, if, if I were to just pave that and make it black, then within two to three years, all of those issues are going to raise back to the top. And we're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna be getting a different complaint. It's gonna be, well, why did you put all this money towards a road? And it's, you know, you didn't do the utility work, or you didn't do all the other things that should be done with it, right? And so, that is an example. And that was, um, I'm sure we we're talking. Um, I talked to one, someone that had probably reached out to you, um, and we had a long conversation, kind of about that and why it was delayed. But it's delayed. And kind of intentionally because we're trying to align all the funding. Mm -hmm. And so as part of the in the water system hyd hydraulic analysis, um, that was identified as one of the high priority streets that need to be repaired. So when we go through and we're selecting these streets, the three of us are sitting together and we're going, okay, here's a road, it needs to be paved. Here's a water main project, mm -hmm. it needs to be paved. Okay, Corey's in interjecting about the sidewalks and we're trying to make sure that okay, here's the amount of money that we have, here's where we're going, and does it all make sense when you start putting all of the picture together? Mm -hmm. um, North Street is, I mean, there's a section of North Street between below Hillhead that is very bad. Mm -hmm. um, it's an understatement. So mm -hmm. um, one of the things this year that we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking out and digging out the worst section of the roadway and making it passable um, because it's, getting to the point where it's borderline impassable. Yeah, thank you. I'm sure you are doing a great job, and I know you are doing a great job, but I just want to make sure that if we have some kind of plan to fix the worst roads, as all uh, I was just trying to learn. So as far as I understood, there's no plan for those specific streets because this this project talks about something else and um yeah just it, should we figure out something or because of the infrastructure at the budget it will be always like that it won't Thank always you. be like that if you don't focus always on the worst first it's a really hard concept because the worst first it doesn't you don't really leverage your dollars well um, the hard thing, the hard thing is that we're also not funded really where we need to be to hit these targets. So we're providing plans that are, we're starting with a baseline that's not really enough to get us there, which makes making these decisions even harder, right? Like if you, if you need a million dollars and you only have just, for example, 500,000, how do you, what do you do with that? And, um, in, you know, on the professional side, it's, well, you maintain what you have, you leverage all of your dollars to the maximum extent feasible. And that's the economics behind it. But there is a reality of you get to these points where streets are just so bad. And so um, I think one of the things that we're talking about internally is trying to focus on um, providing a little bit more interim maintenance on the really bad ones as a measure to get us to, okay, we can't do it today. We obviously can't do them all today either, um, but maybe we are able to make it better until we can do the right method at the right time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's what I was Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how cooperative is this? Is the state when they do a, a big paving project like what they're gonna do with um, Route 2 in coordinating with our with the needs of DPW, do they communicate well, or do they just drop the schedule on you? Do you want to answer that, Corey? I mean, I, I think that they do a good job communicating our needs. Um, I mean, we just were at a, a meeting the other day talking about Corporate Cup and what the city needs in order to make that a successful event. So, um, I mean, Corey is the one that's dealing with the state, um, but 
we we have these project meetings. I think they do a pretty good job at um, you know working with us to meet our needs, um, whether it's you know time of day restrictions. Um, I mean, so we don't end up digging up a lot of their brand new paving to put in water lines afterwards, or I'm they, not going to say that it, it do doesn't they coordinate happen. that way, or um, I, I mean, we we try to yeah. right. Um, but if we don't have all the funding to align at the same time, like yeah. these state these state programs are pretty consistent. They're coming in every 12 or 15 years on a cycle. So when we, Northfield Street was an example that the state was coming in and redoing that roadway. And we actually requested them to hold off for a year and we did the utility work and they were able to get us in within that cycle. But mm -hmm. if we had, if we weren't able to commit, they basically we were in a timeline that they said, you can do it now, or if you're not able to do it, then you're going to miss, you're going to have to wait until sure. we're, we're ready yeah. to come back. Because they're when they're doing their systems, right, they're looking at trying to leverage their dollars just as we are. So having, you know, projects that are all over the place doesn't really align with them either. Yeah, so no, it's good to know they have some. Yeah. They've been they've been good to work with, and if you know well in advance on both sides, um, which they're trying to be more transparent about where they're headed and what they're doing on their end, um, it allows us to adjust and make accommodations accordingly as well. Do they use a system like this? Yes, they they moved to lidar about five years ago. Lauren, you had your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um... Really glad we're talking about this. I hear about roads more than anything else from constituents uh, pretty much every day. Um, one question I do get regularly that I would love your thoughts on is like, why don't we just do a big bond and go in and really get the roads in good shape and then get into this maintenance schedule? And just curious your thoughts, like you have a proposal to you know, modestly increase year over year for like long-term increased sustained funding like are there is there a benefit to some kind of bump in the short term to get ahead of it and then get into more of a maintenance schedule or is it like no it's better because of the way roads work to slowly increase and just sustain that's a great question so roads when we talk about lifespan of a road right it's 12 15 years uh year I mean, to get a road out 20 years without preserving it is a real long shot. So when you are looking at or considering bonding for that, you're going to be paying off your bond after the time that the road is, needs to be repaired again, right? So it, it really doesn't make any sense to say, okay, we have $5 million in unfunded or backlog need. We're going to bond for all of that and we're going to get it all done. And then we're going to move to preservation um, be, because it's the lifespan of the road, right? So it's roads are not something that you want to bond for. If you're going to bond for something, you want to bond for your retaining walls, your sidewalks, things that have a life expectancy that far exceeds the bond term. Uh, that's why most people don't end up uh, bonding for road work um, now with that being said there's an overall bonding capacity right and so um when whenever you're dealing with money we only have a certain pool of money in the capital and that includes the debt service payments for not just road bonds but for any bond that is related to the capital fund um so it you don't necessarily need to to always bond for something, but making sure that, you know, you have a goal of where you need to go and that we can, you can hit there and not, you have enough money to achieve all of the things that you want to do on a, a more global picture. Does that make sense? Yes. And I have actually explained that to constituents kind of like that. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad I wasn't totally at base. Um, the I guess more if we're just thinking about like within the budget and not bonding. Um, I mean, is there like in your ideal world would would like a, just a budgeted bump to? I mean, it sounds like the long term savings if we could really make progress on the roads and get into more of a maintenance cycle. It 
sounds like there's good potential there too. Like, do you think we would save more money over the long term if we did some short term, bigger road investments? Or is not really because I mean, yes, but it it's it we're deferred enough that it's going to it's going to be a pretty hefty lift. I mean, you're going to be looking at like substantially increasing that funding for like sustained for like five years. Um, and then it goes back to the competing needs. Right. And we have equipment, we have buildings, we have all of these things that are fighting over the same pot of money. And that's why it, it gets really hard to, you know, to, I mean, to shuffle all of the money around and to get what you need done. Um, you know, and I think as you look at the, the funding levels of what we need and versus what is kind of actually, you know, what we think it might be realistic to hold kind of the steady state of the tax base and not like astronomically raise rates. Like that's just kind of where we're at. Um, so there's not a great solution um, <laughs> other than we just need to look at everything holistically, prioritize what is most important to you all and where you need to spend, where you would like to spend your resources time and resources so so thinking about that can can this tool analyze that over no which instead of just doing an annual plan or maybe it does all it already does can it do a five-year plan and test um increased investment for three years or for five years and and sort of show show us what the effect would be in the in the years after that so the data that this program would provide would help us to set up to run some of this analysis. The program would not actually do all of that. It would give you calculated, it would help on just the pavement side. Um, I know that Kelly and I have talked about um, like longer term budgeting uh, programs that would do exactly what you're talking about and being able to take all of these different funding groups and plug in all of your money available and to kind of shuffle all of these scenarios, right? If we want to put in this much money, this is, it flows through and kind of spits out, okay, this is where you need to be spending on equipment or buildings, but it, it you have to put in all of your need in order for it to come back out the way that you're, um, the, the, what I think you're trying to, to yeah. get it to do. Um, it's data in, data out. So the more, data that you have to put into the system, the more you can harness the analytic side on the back end. But just for just for road treatment, you could you could get some idea of a longer term. Yeah. So we we do have a program and it's in it's called Paver TM. And it goes, we when we put in a road, I can show you the a decay curve of the, the road. I can per, I can actually develop different funding um mechanisms and programs uh with it the hard thing is it's a computer and it runs like equations right so to get them to do like the worst first scenario like the computer doesn't really want to ever tell you to do the worst first it's because of the economics behind it so you would have to kind of massage it and manipulate it so that you're telling it that you want to put x amount of funding towards these lower the roads that are in really bad condition and like you you have to break out the different funding groups in order to get the program to kind of simulate what you're would like what we'd like yeah so a lot of manual process. it was a, yeah. it's very 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 manual which is why i'm excited to go to the lidar and to kind of see how um what that data looks like and what how we can utilize that better um we're also we're working on integrating an asset management system um which will help to tie in with just budgeting cost on all of our roads um so the lidar the information that we get from the lidar will go into our asset management system and then we'll be able to leverage the information that's put into that system as well like tracking uh you know amount of time staff spent on patching potholes on a certain street uh, when we move into the new system, we're going to be, uh, we're, we're going to specify like, okay, we did a pothole, but it was on this asset. Right now, the way that our program works, 
when they do pothole patching, it's a generic overarching, right? So like when I, when you say how much money do we spend on pothole patching, I'm not going to be able to say we spent 1000 on state street, 5,000 on North street. When we move into this new system, we would be able to provide that type of data to you because staff will be reporting on the work that they're doing on each of their sub assets. Cool. I understand when we don't want to bond and do all the streets, but you had some numbers up there, what you said was needed. And I'm interested uh, if you had a million dollars a year and you could reasonably do an assortment of streets in connection with your utilities and grants, would you be able to spend it? A million dollars. Do the work? Yeah, I mean, we did a million dollars last year. We did one just over a million dollars last year and we resurfaced four and a half miles. Last year was the, since I've been doing this for 10 years, was the most miles of road that we have ever preserved, maintained, uh, reconstructed in any single year. When I started this pro working with this program, most of Montpelier's roads were so bad that everything was in the Miller fill reconstruct or reclaim. There was no option to really crack seal because everything was beyond that level. Yeah. Um, Thank you for reminding us. That's why it was started the steady state. Yes, and, exactly. And that is why. Like, yes. Yep. So what would be the ideal annual amount to better catch up? I'd say a million dollars. Uh, Another million dollars? Yeah, one, we need to, in FY25, we would need a million dollars and we would be making very significant headway on our overall PCI um, and improving our entire network. Um, and okay, that was one part of, at least for me, why I supported the sales tax. I thought we'd get a half a million out of that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Remember that at budget time, guys. <laughs> Anybody else have anything before we wrap this up? This this has been great. Now, every every single time we get these really great uh, data heavy presentations that really help us understand uh, way more than we did before. So thank you. Bill's raising his hand. Oh oh, Bill. Thanks. Um, for well, Zach, great job. Uh, what a, a couple of things I just want to add that didn't get mentioned, but I think are, are relevant. One, uh, the, the question about the bond, I mean, certainly the answer that Zach gave and that Lauren that you've been giving is correct, but there's a little bit more to it than that. And some of that has to do with the volume of work that is taken. Remember, you know, our road work season is relatively short here in Vermont. It's not like other places where they can do it almost year round. And there's only so many contractors to go around and only so much of our staff. So even if, you know, we had five or 10 million, um, you know, at one shot, uh, I think we'd still be limited in how much we could do in the first, you know, over the first two years, we wouldn't necessarily be able to do it all in that quick a time. Um, so I think there's, there's just a capacity issue there. Secondly, the question about grants, I think is really important because Zach mentioned the, the state aid for highway grants. Um, now there's the, the class two that you can, you can apply for. Uh, and he's right. They cycle around every community. It basically just goes around. So you wait your turn every 10 or 12 years. And that's the system. Uh, there's, you know, and um, but the other other thing that I think people should be aware of. Every year, the state provides general highway aid to, to municipalities. And it's on a per mile basis. So first of all, until I think last year or the year, sometime in the last couple of years, it hadn't increased in over 15 years. So as costs were rising for towns and cities, the state aid was essentially going down as a percentage because it was just a flat fund. Um, but secondly, you know, we in Montpelier have like 42 miles of road. Um, there are many, many communities that are physically larger than us that have 80, 90 miles per road. And they pay everybody on our, you know, so much per mile of your town roads. But almost all of our roads are paved. And in most of those other communities, very few roads are paved. So one of the things that we see when people, and, and so first of all, let me say, our roads are in bad shape and we need to invest more in them, no question. However, what we also see sometimes in our neighboring towns is well-paved roads 
Um, because, and then when we go on their gravel roads, we're not thinking about it. We're like, well, it's a gravel road. Of course, it's not as good as a paved road. But that's the condition of those roads. You know, that's been driving around in mud season knows um, those roads are in far worse shape than, than ours are. Uh, so, you know, you got East Montpelier, some of these places, they have, you know, a couple of miles of road that they um, that they bond for, or, you know, fix every so often. And they keep them in pretty good shape because that's, you know, all they have. But again, it's it's this per mile basis. It's not per mile of paved road, per mile of, of uh, gravel road. It's just per mile of road. And so communities like us, like Barry City, like, you know, places that are more co- more compact, and all pavement don't do as well by the state's formula. And, you know, we don't get any special exception for being the state's capital. We hear that a lot. Well, you're the capital city, your roads should be great. Yep, but we're not getting any special, I mean, other than I guess our pilot payments. But uh, in terms of general impact on roads, we're not seeing anything um, special. So enough ranting, I'll leave it to the experts. Okay. That's it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. This is great. All right. We are up to city council reports. Starting your end. No report tonight. Tim. I only thought it's just for future for consent agenda because it seems like last couple of times, maybe some of the key items that if just as we see them coming, like Country Club Road and um, the water line issue, issue you know, the big issues that we just don't put them on a consent agenda, just keep them out front. Because I think people in the community want to see what's going on. Thanks. No report. Thank you. Uh, just a couple quick things. Um, one, I've gotten feedback from several people about um, the Berry Street, in particular, the crosswalk between the Berry, the rec center and the senior center, a couple of people who have stories of just about getting hit there. Um, I don't know if that has been considered under any of the, whichever transportation infrastructure or um, for one of the lighted crosswalks. I, and I can't remember, I know we've talked about that whole area a lot in the past, but just, just putting that idea out there because it's come up from a number of constituents that they've had issues in between the senior center and kids going to the rec center. Seems like it could be a good um, place for that kind of crosswalk. Um, and the other thing that I've, heard from a couple of constituents um, about my ride, some just feedback for especially some um, elder members of our community that are continuing to struggle with using it. And I wasn't quite sure who at this point, is it the transportation infrastructure committee? Or like, is anyone, who do I provide feedback to? Is it the state now? Can I, I don't know if Donna might have Can an I answer. answer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, please do. The oversight committee no longer meets because the pallet project finished. Okay, so you can call them direct. So it's now just the state GM. Okay, so there's GM, the, GMT. Okay, yeah. they've. Okay, so there's no one within the community. <laughs> That's okay. I can sh- I can pass that along. Um, and my last question was just um, I don't know Kelly if you know when we're going to be taking back up the homelessness. Um, report if that's the next meeting I'm just feeling a lot of urgency with the yeah. money running out wanting to be making decisions and moving forward so I don't know if we know when we'll be so taking that up. if I can oh, yeah that. Um, so as one of the things that I wanted to kind of put as part of the city manager's report for tonight is that um we are working on evaluating um, the rec center per our conversation last week. Um, we have approached three firms. We did do a site visit um, this past Friday. And so those reports will be coming. Um, and we certainly can provide a status update. I hesitate to give a direct timeline because it's dependent on getting the, that information back from the um, firms. However, um, you know, I think looking into either the the meeting on the 10th or the 24th. I know that the Homelessness Task Force also um, is working on a resolution to put forward to come to council with um, as soon as the 10th um, so that then we can maybe get the legislative delegation um, and um, some representation from the state here to discuss the issue. Great. 
Okay, I've got a couple of items for my report. One, uh, I just received a notice. Uh, Montpelier has again been named by the Arbor Day Foundation as a Tree City USA. And, and to qualify for that, we need, it's too bad I didn't say this while John was here, but uh, to qualify for this, we have four requirements at maintaining a tree board or department. And John, of course, is on the tree board. We just reappointed him last time. Having a tree care ordinance, dedicating an annual community forestry budget of at least $2 per capita, and hosting an Arbor Day observance and proclamation. So, yeah, yes. Um, uh, second, um, I would mention that in the... Uh, this week, I went into the House Environment and Energy Committee to testify about uh, what the city is looking for in uh, S100, which is the big housing bill that's going on, and arguing in favor of uh, some modest changes to Act 250 to enable us to uh, have projects, have the threshold go from 10 to 25 units to uh, be able to be uh, judged just by the city and not go through Act 250. Um, it's, it's been kind of an uphill battle with all this stuff. And it seems like the, every year, the idea about Act 250 is, well, we're gonna do something about that next year. And so I'm not sure what's gonna happen, um, but, uh, We've been working on that and uh, and trying to work on the uh, project based TIF and it's it's been slow going this year. Um, and then the last thing is uh, Green Up Day, uh, May sixth. It's coming right up. Uh, we've got support from the Department of Public Works and uh, and Chief Gowans just uh, emailed to let us know that. Uh, the uh, fire department will also be uh, there to make a sharps con uh, container available. So May 6th, which is a week from Saturday or Sunday. And that's all I've got. Um, uh, clerk's report. Dogs, dogs, dogs. Everybody, please. We have not bounced back from uh dog licensing since before the uh um pandemic it's we're really low so i'm getting out uh an insert with all the uh water bills going out which has maybe a slightly scary edge to it you gotta get your dogs they're coming for your dog but well, it's so, funny because yeah. there are so many new pandemic pups uh yeah, really required. Yeah. yeah well i'm expecting my budget to my intake here is going to go way up. I think this this could I could generate hundreds. It could be flooded. I don't know. I have never done anything like this, so hopefully it'll really work out. So um, I never talk about dogs, right? Um, also, I did find out that there is such a thing as Municipal Clerks Week. It's next week. Oh, eight, 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 eight. eight. Okay, you're gonna need flowers on the cake. <laughs> Is, is there a, is there a special day within Municipal Clerks Week? <laughs> well, we may be able to generate it. Oh. <laughs> and that's what that's it for you. That's that's all I, I can go on it. Now, but... No need. <laughs> City Manager. Um, so I mentioned sort of the items that I was going to mention as part of the, the homelessness um, task force, also evaluating um, the rec center. The other thing that I, I do want to note, um, even though with our discussion earlier, we, we are slated at this point to move ahead with the next phase of engagement for Country Club Road. Um, the first of those engagements um, is going to be this Saturday, April 29th on site starting at 10 a.m., um, so, and then we've got a bunch of information posted on the website. So I wanted to mention that. And then Bill, I don't know if you wanted to take it away, um, from zoom land. Sure. Uh, yeah. Greetings from uh, greater Chicago, uh, Cubs won last night. It was freezing cold. Um, but we had great seats. Um, 
you know, as far as the homeless thing goes, we're meeting uh, Monday when I get back with, um, again, it'll be the second time with Barry in Berlin, just to make sure we're, you know, communicating and, you know, cooperating as sort of how we're approaching all this. One of the things is that uh, we keep getting differing numbers and, and actually, I, I guess, lower numbers each time about, about what the impact might actually be as, as, as they're finding, you know, more and more people are identifying where they might go and those kinds of things. So we don't know. I mean, obviously, we're preparing for a large influx of people, but it you know, may or may not be the case. So, um, you know, I think there's this, you know, we didn't. We'd rather be overprepared and underwhelmed than the other way around, but uh, we also don't want to get people in a panic if there's no need to be. So uh, we're going to be talking about that a lot on Monday, and again, uh, whether or not we, as, as maybe even the three communities, should get together and make some sort of public statement about how this is being done. And you know, again, I think the frustrating is there is no, there is no long-term plan from the state about what to do about this, how to transition people to more permanent housing and I know there are some other other plans on uh, the, the books. Uh, appreciate this conversation tonight. It was great. Um, all, all of the items um, and uh, we'll we'll keep talking. You know, I think that uh, I'd like to respond quickly to Tim's comment about the consent agenda. You know, I think as we all work together with this new group, it will be it's really helpful to get the, the feedback that we get about what is or isn't, you know, and, and even the, the Country Club Road thing was really just meant to be informative. The water pipe thing tonight was really just meant to be uh, approving the contract so we can have the big discussion uh, at the next meeting, uh, which will probably be the centerpiece of, of our discussion. So, um, you know, we'll figure out what, what makes it work or, and, and, and begin to reassure anything, just everybody, just, you know, because something's on the consent agenda, it can easily be pulled off for discussion. It's, it's just there for convenience, not because it has to be. So, uh, so I guess I'm done. Thanks. Okay, great. It is now 1032 and we are adjourned.